Welcome to Fantasy Island, Mike. Good evening. Oh, that's the wrong video. I use an OBS today. There we are. How's it going? One moment while I unmute my computer from earlier when I ah. screwed something up. <laughs> there we go. All righty. Awesome. Good evening. You got a better seat. Yeah. You have your adult beverage, I see. Oh, just uh, just the water. Yeah, I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll uh, be, I'll be uh, popping a cork a little bit later tonight. I'm sure. <laughs> well, thanks for, uh, uh, thanks for presenting to us tonight. This is gonna be awesome. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That was, uh, um, yeah, quite a, uh, yeah, quite an interesting choice for uh, for evening. I, uh, I didn't quite realize that as we were setting things up, and then I was like, <laughs> oh wow, yeah, okay. Well, you know, the thing is. <laughs> Padnug has, and it's funny because even some local people have made comments. I'm like, dude, we meet on election night every year in November. <laughs> this yeah. is not different than last year or the year before, uh -huh. year before that. And Oregon being a, uh, has been vote by mail for so long, it really, really doesn't matter much here. <laughs> mm. If you haven't yeah. voted by now, you're probably not going to. So, Yeah. Yeah, very true. For us. Yeah, yeah Texas... Well, uh, not so much on the vote by mail now. <laughs> no, I, you know, and I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm mm -hmm. kind of somewhere in between. Yay. I'm glad, I'm glad we do it. But honestly, the things they, that people are concerned about, I think are still valid concerns. And mm -hmm. just because it works here doesn't mean it works everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I also suspect that if there's going to be fraud, they're not going to worry about it when it's just Oregon and Washington and a few little things like that. It's going to be what California does it, or maybe Texas does it, right? That's it, it's fun. possible. I mean, yeah, that's when Before, fraud does become a thing. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really been uh, in the in the race for a long time, mm -hmm. and now there's something interesting happening here. Okay, yeah, kind of like that. There's something happening. Right mm -hmm. I am going to start sharing my slides. So you're you. I, I mean, I feel silly asking, but I'm going. I, I need to. <laughs> You've done a lot of zooming in your your time. Right? Yes, okay. yes, I have. Just yeah. Yep. I I have every content you did, <laughs> but you know, you could. Yep. Be so I can. Guy, right? I yeah. can find the little green share screen button in the bottom. I can. Excellent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. getting quite uh, quite a lot of a lot of light on me. You getting the. Yeah, well, I've, I've got mine at half, so. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have decent turnout. I don't think it'll be the number that was on the site, but. No, never is. <laughs> yeah. we, you know, it's funny. When, when we meet in person, we get a more dependable count than I ever do on the mm. online. I, I actually was surprised by that. I figured the. Yeah, uh, that is unusual. Would be, you know, what's, what's the downside? Why can't, why wouldn't you be here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I see Jan. Hey, Jan. <laughs> Jan comes all the way from Belgium. Excellent. I actually invited people who are, I know are still in Europe too, so. Oh, Michael. Good to see you again, sir. Well. Yeah, if if my usual time is, is late for you, this is already starting pretty late. So well, maybe it's 2, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning now? Three o'clock in the morning. Three in the morning, yeah. Okay. Jeez. I will, I will have just, just enough time to sleep afterwards before your, <laughs> your Wednesday meeting. Ah, <laughs> uh, so. yes. Fair warning, I am eating my dinner too. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it's worth uh, the, the night time uh, to watch this. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. If that's not an endorsement, I don't know what is, right? I know it. <laughs> so I think I I think I emailed you the basics, but I'll just run through. Slides are going when they uh, when we officially start, which is about six thirty. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll go through the slides. I'll let the uh, supporters who are online say a quick something, give themselves a plug, and then uh, we go through a little the quick. Um, here's what's coming, and then. Michael, go for it. Oh, and Mike, are you? And but by the way, you are Michael, right? Or Mike? That's correct. Yes, okay. Michael. Yes. Um, are you okay with the uh, recording? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> because I just realized mm -hmm. I could stop recording it if you didn't. No. 
to do that. <laughs> I do mean stop right now, though, because we don't want to catch all the crap in the middle. Pause recording. There, recording. Look at that. There it goes. Everyone get that little recording icon now? Yes, indeed. Just remember, don't say things you won't want recorded. So just in case you missed it, we've got Michael Perry presenting Exploring on Immutable Architecture this month. If somehow you miss these spots where you can find PadMug, please take a note of them. I think the some of the most important would be uh, Meetup and YouTube because sometime in the next couple, three days, I should be able to get this posted up to YouTube in case you missed that one comment that was vital to your, to your uh, understanding of the presentation. If, you, uh, if you've been attending for a while, you well know the reason PadNug even exists is because Microsoft made a little thing called .NET 20 years ago, almost. <laughs> almost 20 years ago. And PadNug started in late 2001, I think is when they first came up with the idea. I didn't start going until later 2002. Also, not so much lately, but Intel has been an excellent supporter. If we still met in person, we'd probably be at an Intel auditorium right now. <laughs> so we have several or nearby organizations that help make our meetings possible. Now, a lot of those have to do with pizza that we haven't had for a while, but we're working on some ideas of how to sort of make up for a little bit in December. So I hope everyone will be planning to join us for our big December meeting. And yes, Craig, it's a shame we don't have the Wi-Fi code, but it's not as useful here. So IT Motives, Tony Seminary, you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, good to be back virtually. Um, it's been a long time. Uh, Alina has been holding it down for the last several months, last several years, actually, I should say, and doing it quite well. Uh, lots of thumbs ups, of course. Uh, we're a local recruiting company here in town. We've been in business over 12 years. Uh, one of the things that we believe in is building long-term relationships, both with our clients and our candidates. That is one of our whys. And we would enjoy getting to know as many of you as possible even if you're not looking and just want to know what's going on in the market, we're happy to chat and tell you what's happening, whether again, whether you're hiring or looking to be hired uh, or none of, none of the above. Um, so thank you very much for this platform to be here tonight. I, if it wasn't for all of you, we wouldn't be here. So we definitely appreciate the opportunity to network with y'all and get to know y'all on a long-term basis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Scott, just so you know, you happen to be right next to Jeff Doolittle and you're showing him on your computer. So it's kind of like I've got double, double Jeff right now. <laughs> oh, he knows. Trust me. <laughs> um, and it looks like Danielle's willing to buy drinks after this. So Danielle, do you want to go next? <laughs> sure. I'm always happy to buy drinks, Rich. You know that. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, a few of you I haven't seen before. Um, happy to introduce myself, talk about the local market. Um, I support uh, .NET, any data roles um, that we have with over 100 clients here in the local market. Um, and we have quite a few openings right now. So um, I, I sent my email in the chat. So I'd love to speak with you whether you're looking now or, or in the future, or you have somebody in mind that could benefit from having a, a local resource. So Excellent. good to see everybody and, and we'll see you soon. And just so you know, Michael, Tech Systems, mm -hmm. you probably have those. Oh yes, too, so. yeah, I've got some great friends at Tech Systems here. So yeah. she, no, no offense, Tony, but you don't have a Texas office that I'm aware of, so. <laughs> 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 and uh, for those who don't know, the recruiters typically, and at least two of them already have, will put their contact information in the Zoom chat so you can uh, reach out to them directly. You also could uh, chat them on the Zoom chat too and say, hey, I desperately need a job. What can you do for me tomorrow? 
soft source. Laurie, where'd you go? You must have gone on page two. Oh, there you are. Oh, no. You it can't be on page two. <laughs> That's no good. I got two pages. Uh, uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Laurie Hannon. If you haven't seen uh, me at Padnug before or haven't heard of soft source before, talking about soft source is my side gig. I've been coding today as I code most days. Uh, soft source, if you haven't heard of us, we also don't have a Texas office. We are entirely local to uh, the Portland area. At least all our consultants are local to the Portland area. Our clients are local-ish. Um, of course, everybody's working from home right now. Anyway, we yeah. are providing software engineering skills to our clients. So if you are thinking about making a change, whether you desperately need a job tomorrow or uh, are looking at a little bit longer term kind of a change, uh, my information will be in the chat. Reach out to me, ask me why I stay at SoftSource. I've been there six years now uh, and choosing to uh, code for them and their clients. Excellent, Lauren. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, why don't we call on Mr. Andrew from Vanderhauen? And if you want to say anything nice about Charlie, you can. He's got another child, apparently. So, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, my uh, my best friend Charlie uh, owns Catapult Recruiting. He's a great guy. Uh, if you get a call from him or Berg or any of those folks over there, take it. They're good people. Uh, yeah, so I'm Andrew. I'm with Vanderhauen. Uh, we're a local recruiting firm. We've been here in Portland for a super long time, uh, and I've been coming here to Padnug for about 11 years, and it's, uh, yeah, I'm really appreciative to be here. So we, uh, we're just a, a local company. Uh, we work with mainly with local companies, uh, and yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're looking or just want to chat, give me a call. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And Michael, isn't that awesome that you have a recruiter who's willing to plug his competitor too? Is that I know that's that is that is fantastic. I I, I mean I just love what, uh, you know, what what everybody's doing in order to support the community. I mean, awesome. Thank you. Um, I will also mention Robert Half. Stephen's not available to join us tonight, but of course is is uh, here in spirit. He I think is if I remember correctly he said his wife has a doctor appointment in just a conflicting hour or so. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. oh. Keyboard focus, Jane, sorry. So here's a few little uh, podcasts that people might find interesting. Uh, there was one, what was it called? Software Engineering Radio? Is that, somebody had something to say about that? Jeff? Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Software Engineering Radio. We've got about, I think currently 10 hosts. Uh, around the world, various time zones, various countries. And uh, yeah, it's it's one of the premier um, podcasts on software. Actually, so you see .NET Core there at the top. Uh, I was just speaking with a host of the .NET Core show about having him on Software Engineering Radio in the near future. And I believe my next guest is actually slated to be somebody who's here tonight. So Ooh, wow. yeah, right. So uh, that's exciting. Yeah. I'll be uh, hosting Michael on Software Engineering Radio here in the next, I don't know, week or so. We're, we're pretty backed up. It, it's actually a good thing. We have a lot of hosts right now and a lot of content. So typically shows that are recorded take a few weeks to actually get into the, uh, the rotation. But yeah, Michael will be joining me to talk about a little bit um, you know, more detail about immutable architecture and some of the concepts around that. So if you enjoy the presentation tonight, which you better, or you don't belong here, um, <laughs> <laughs> then you'll definitely enjoy Michael's episode that's uh, up and coming on Software Engineering Radio. Excellent. For just a second, I thought you were going to say Alina was your next guest. But... Ah, I mean, you know, if we're going to have a show on recruiting, she'd, oh. she'd definitely be my first pick. And by the way, Michael, I want you to, you did watch a, watch that little show called um, uh, 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 Mandalorian, perhaps? Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> you definitely uh, watched that, but yeah. Grim. 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 No, no, I'm afraid not. Well, it was mostly filmed in Portland. And our own Alina was uh, had a speaking role in that show. Sweet. Yeah, they were hunting monsters and such, you know. Oh, I love monster hunting. Yes, yes. So it was, it was, it was kind of fun. Anyway, here's what's coming in the near future. A uh, week from today, we've got the West Side Geek Dinner. 
as usual. Uh, day after that, the Oregon data community has something going on. They don't put quite as much stuff on their meetup as, as others do. Uh, two weeks from today, the Portland Azure User Group is hosting a presentation on um, protecting your sensitive data. Agile PDX has something the next day on uh, principle 11 in their virtual puppet series. I, I don't have much more information than that offhand. And then three weeks from today, I count myself. Oh, excuse me, I'll get the ADF, AWS user group in there on the 19th. On the 24th, Padnug has their second since COVID East Side Geek Dinner. It's about time for a seat side peeps. Thank you. That's right. That's right. I agree with you on that one. And for those who are not local, the reason we haven't had them during any of them during COVID is because although our venues for the west side were able to open up, the east side we meet at a place that is technically a bowling alley, and that just was allowed to open up. They weren't even going to open the bowling side of it, but uh, just days after they reopened for food, the uh, state of Oregon said, okay, bowling alleys can open. So they are actually a bowling alley also, but they also have a really interesting set of menus now too. Yeah, you owe it to yourself to get the uh, ahi tuna tower. It's incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my wife agrees with you on that. Go to Grand Central Kitchen and just get it done. It's worth it. Michael, you got to come visit to have it. It's amazing. I know, I'm, I'm coming just for that. Well, yeah, life-changing. There is a chance that they have it at the Thirsty Lion down there too. It's, they're affiliated. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> just, to get, just to get you to go out there. Um, and then December 1st, we have our annual Christmas party-ish, holiday party, whatever you want to call it. Uh, as I say, it's a lesser party because it won't be what it usually is. <laughs> but Scott will be presenting. We will start a half hour later because he has Taekwondo. You might remember last year, he scurried in from post-Taekwondo. And we are working on some ideas of how to make it more worth it than usual. We'll have swag, we'll have something for most attendees, etc. Then finally on December 3rd, the Portland SQL Server Group will have a past retrospective and their uh, virtual holiday party. So that's pretty much everything we have on the docket in the next uh, month or so. As I said, Mr. Doolittle, I would love for you to go ahead and introduce today's speaker since you helped get the speaker for us. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. It's an honor to introduce our, our guest. So I have a short list of books that are must reads for software engineers and architects. And number one on the list is this book right here by David Parnas. It's, it's technically not by David Parnas, but this, these are essays that are collected and contributed uh, by David Parnas. If you don't know who David Parnas is, you absolutely owe it to yourself to learn. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And uh, if you don't know the names Dykstra and Parnas, shame on you. You need to know those names. They're, uh, you know, they're absolutely fun. A lot of people have heard of, you know, Von Neumann and, 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 and like, yeah, whatever. But yeah, you need to know this man. Um, he literally has, uh, defined the nature of software as it should be, and yet he's been very much ignored and uh, looked over by the industry. So Software Fundamentals, David Parnas, absolutely amazing. You need to get that. Uh, the next book on my list is res uh, Exploring Requirements, Quality Before Design by Gauss and Weinberg. If you have a product owner or a person in QA, I hope you recognize that the role of QA is actually to manage requirements. And if you don't know that, well, then we should talk because that's actually their job. And most of them don't know it. And uh, the job of product is actually to manage customer ex expectations, not to beat developers over the head and tell them what to deliver. So this book is absolutely fundamental and it's amazing and you need to check it out. So there's that one. And then architects, what's your job? Your job is to manage complexity. You didn't know that? We should talk. So this is the book on managing complexity. It is called Writing Software by Yuval Lowy. Uh, he is an amazing software architect. Some would even call him the software architect writing software, a method for system and project design. Architects, you should be designing the system and the project that you're going to build. 
Most architects don't know how to do that. Most architects are tech leads. This book will help you actually be an architect. But recently I came across a book and I was researching books, current books on architecture. And I was very, very pleased to come by the fourth book on my list. And, I, and I'm not kidding when I say these are literally the four books on my list. Anything else, throw it away. You're wasting your time. Uh, they might help you a little bit, but they're not going to accelerate your career. Anything like these four books that I'm sharing with you tonight. So this book right here, The Art of Immutable Architecture by Michael Perry. Uh, this book can absolutely fundamentally change the nature of our industry as we go forward. And I am very, very pleased to not say much more about it because I don't want to steal the thunder of our very special guest tonight, Mr. Michael Perry, who is joining us from Dallas, Texas. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Michael. We're glad you're here. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to come share with y'all. And wow, I am, I am, I am speechless. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, all right, I do want to. Uh, oh. Host has disabled participant screen sharing. I'm sorry. Well, no, we to... yeah. Where are you? There you are. More. That's what happens when you put Rich in charge. <laughs> you know, it's a crapshoot. Right. Let's see. No, that wasn't the right button. Dang it. Make co host. There we go. You should be able to now, Michael. And there it is. Yes. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Let's get that off the screen. Okay, well, let's get that one off the screen too. Goodness, there's what we're after. Yes, so yeah, don't, thank you again. Um, wanted to, well, I gotta push the share button. Wanted to um, uh, share with you the uh, um, the art of immutable architecture, uh, the, uh, the kind of the system that uh, that I've been using throughout my career and, uh, and kind of developing uh, based on uh, a, a sound foundation in mathematics that has uh, has really helped me to um, to build uh, reliable systems and uh, in particular distributed systems because distributed systems are hard. Uh, we don't need to make things any harder for ourselves. We should uh, we should adopt a fundamental set of rules that we know are going to um, to solve some problems for us. Uh, let me go ahead and make sure that I can see the the chat so folks can. Uh, can uh, interact during the conversation. I do want this to be a conversation, so I'll keep the chat window open so that we can uh, see what's going on. And uh, um, also feel free to come off mute and, uh, uh, and talk uh, at any point in time. So um, uh, I have some resources I would like to, uh, to share with you. Um, and one of them is the GitHub repository of the code that we're gonna be walking through tonight. Um, so if you uh, want to follow along, go ahead and clone that repo and, uh, um, and get that opened up in, uh, in your editor of choice. Um, this is an example of, uh, of a, a, a first time immutable architecture, just kind of your, um, your, your first step from the sorts of uh, systems that, uh, um, that you may be used to building to, uh, to one that uh, adopts immutability and takes immutability seriously. Um, there are a few other uh, resources that uh, that you can go ahead and grab. So, um, if you uh, have Visual Studio Code installed, there's a ex an extension by uh, Yao uh, jo Joao. That's how it's pronounced, Joao Pinto. Um, so, search for GraphViz and uh, pick out Joao Pinto's extension there. Um, and uh, there's the uh, the repo again. So. Um, while you're grabbing that, let me tell you a little bit about immutability and why it should be your your default choice when you're uh, when you're building systems. Um, when when things change, it's it's hard for you to know that you have the same version as somebody else. Uh, you might be working on older information than they uh, than they have, um, or you might have made a change to yours and they don't have it yet, and so things might be out of sync. Um, even uh, even more confusing is when two people make a change without knowledge of one another. And so you've got these concurrent changes happening. Um, and so how do you resolve uh, these problems? Um, this happens a lot in distributed systems, uh, but it also happens in 
uh, in regular web applications. I mean, have you ever opened up a, uh, a browser tab and then you went over to another tab, maybe duplicated, made some, some changes, and then you came back and you realized, oh, my old data is still here. Um, that's, uh, that, that's another place where things can get out of sync. Um, but uh, when you're talking about immutable records, and that's the, um, the deliberate decision not to change things. Um, when an object is immutable, that means every copy is just as good as every other. So you know, if I have a copy of an object um, that is immutable, I know that your copy is exactly the same. And that's the starting point for a, a whole body of mathematics that uh, can really help us to understand uh, how data flows through a system, a distributed system for sure, but uh, but also other systems in general. So, um, so I start with immutability as the default position and only move away from it when I have a really good compelling reason to do so. Um, and uh, and if I if I if I receive that uh, reason, I will challenge it to, to try to see if I can keep immutability and solve that problem as well. So, uh, if you've got the tools, then. Uh, Thank you very much for, uh, for following along. Um, we are going to be uh, exploring some key concepts as we talk about this architecture. So the very first thing is we're going to be using alternate keys. So in a database, you've got your uh, primary key that's usually an auto incrementing ID. And we're going to be looking at why it's important to have an alternate key for every table and, and why you should use that in, uh, in most communications. Um, we're going to be taking snapshots. So this is kind of a starting point in keeping a, uh, a history of immutable objects. Uh, there are more advanced um, patterns that you can learn after this, but we'll start with, uh, with snap uh, snapshots in order to model things that change. Um, but then if you can't change things, you also can't delete them. So how do you delete things in an immutable architecture? That's tombstones. Um, and then something that really changed uh, the way that, uh, that I approach a lot of problems, especially caching, uh, was content addressable storage. So I'm going to be showing you how you can apply content addressable storage in, uh, uh, in your applications. Um, and then commutative messages. So as you, um, as you have different parts of your system communicating with one another, you want to make sure that those messages commute. And that uh, is going to make sure that you solve some of the, the fundamental problems of, of uh, message infrastructure. So these are the key concepts we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and uh, exploring a, um, a simple uh, application based on these, these concepts. So the application that we're going to be exploring is Festify. This is the Festify promotion system. So we're going to promote shows. Um, so what you can do with this is, let's go ahead and add a new show. So um, yeah, Jeff uh, Foxworthy is uh, going to be you know, playing in January in Dallas. Yeah, no, he's not. He's going to be in, in Portland, Oregon. Assuming COVID you know, does, behaves right. Of course, yes. Um, and I'm not sure what the uh, yeah. How about the Moda Center? <laughs> and Moda Center, okay. Moda M O D A. Yep. All right. So, so we enter that information. Uh, pick his image here. You know, we've got uh, Gabriel Iglesias. We can do uh, Enrique or Julio, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll go with Jeff Foxworthy. He'll, he's he's a class act. So, you know, go ahead and add him there. And now we've got uh, uh, the uh, the shows that uh, that we're going to promote. Uh, we can come in here and edit the show and say, you know what, uh, I really do want to see uh, you know, Julio take the stage. So, um, or uh, or we can go back through and and remove. And so, your typical um, CRUD type of application: you're creating things, you're updating things, you're you're deleting things. Um, but this is based on an immutable architecture. So behind the scenes, we are not updating we're not changing anything um, and we're not deleting. Yeah, but there's, there's no deletion happening in this database. Um, the only two operations that we're doing in CRUD are really create and read. Uh, we're simulating updates and we're simulating deletes using immutable records. And, um, 
and that's that's uh, going to help us to uh, to keep a history, keep track of everything that has happened in our system. And then we can you know, simply query the current state based on a, um, a view of that history. Uh, and that's really going to help us when we are now talking between different systems. So if we've got a backup of this database, we could just take all of the new records that we inserted in, into this one and now just play those onto the other database. Um, if we've got an active-active uh, sort of a, a, a data replication system where we're trying to do disaster recovery in that way. Uh, we can switch over to another database, start inserting records over here, and then we can switch back. And this one, we can, we can be live, and we can start inserting here, and meanwhile, play those, uh, those records that we captured into this one, and they'll feather in, and they'll, they'll merge. So um, that, uh, that uh, yeah, that uh, capability really helps us a lot in a lot of the problems that we're going to be solving, and so that's why um, I choose immutability as my as my default position. So that's the application. So here we are in the uh, the project um, to to keep things uh, nice and simple for this. Uh, presentation, uh, everything that's in the promotion application is all in one project. Um, if you're a fan of uh, layered architectures, so maybe uh, maybe like the onion architecture, maybe you like uh, vertical slice architectures, maybe you like um, uh, clean architecture from Steve Smith. Um, uh, whatever um, architectural style you're talking about for organizing your code, do that, absolutely. The choice for immutability is um, is congruent to that. It's, uh, it's, it's a different uh, decision. And so um, it's just really to keep things simple and all in one place, that it's all in one project. But uh, you know, please go ahead and feel free to layer to manage your, um, your dependencies. So we've got, um, you know, primarily we'll be looking at our data access section here. And so we've got some entities that represent uh, things that are in the database. And uh, then we've got some queries and some commands. So I am doing a little bit of an architectural style known as CQRS. We're separating our queries from our commands. Um, and, and it's really just to have a, um, a, a list of, of queries that you could run against the database. And then, um, so every single query is uh, returning something, but not having any side effects versus commands every single, single command returns nothing and just has side effects. So that separation of commands from queries, I find to be um, kind of an important thing, but it's, it's also uh, not uh, necessary for uh, immutable architecture. It's just kind of a, something that, uh, that keeps things clean. So that's the system that we'll be evaluating, that we'll be uh, exploring. And so let's go ahead and look at how these key concepts play in that system. So I'll start with alternate keys. The idea here is that you want to hide the auto-incremented ID that is uh, used inside of the database to maintain um, the object identity. So in this particular database, uh, this is the database structure that we're looking at. Every table has an alternate key. So let's kind of go through them. Let's uh, start up here at the show table. So a show record represents a uh, show that we are promoting. And uh, you can see the only things that this table has are a show ID. That's uh, the primary key, and that's the um, auto-incrementing ID. And then it has a show good alternate key. So this is just a unique identifier. Um, and so as an alternate key, this has a unique constraint in the database. And you'll notice that no other rows, in, uh, no other columns in here. So um, we're not keeping any information about the show in this table. Um, you can really think of this as a way of trading in a GUID in order to get an integer. That's pretty much all it's doing here. The identity of the show is the GUID, not the integer. So um, now going down a level, we've got our show description. So that's got our foreign key back to the show uh, ID. And it's capturing the modified date, the uh, date at which um, we, uh, we changed the record. Um, and then it's got all of the data that makes up the show description. 
the alternate key is that pair, the show ID and the modified date. So that means that uh, you won't have any other show description with the same show ID that was modified at the same date. Those two things uniquely identify this show description. But now when I want to talk about a particular description of a show, um, I'll use these two uh, fields as the identifier. This is the alternate key for it. Um, and then we've got show removed. Okay, this is interesting. We've got a record that represents that another record should be removed. Um, and so this has our show removed ID. So again, it's got our primary key auto incrementing. The alternate key is that show ID and the removed date. So the time at which that uh, particular show was removed from the promotion system. And so every one of these tables has an alternate key. And for the most part, the alternate key is everything else in the table. Uh, the one exception being the, um, uh, the uh, show description, but uh, we can talk about why that is and uh, where some of the alter alternatives are. Um, so yeah, every table has an alternate key except for this one. What, what's, what's going on with this content table over here? Well, we can see that the primary key for the content table is uh, already a, uh, a hash. It's not an integer. It doesn't have an auto-incrementing ID. So we're just taking the hash of the, uh, of the contents of the record, turning that into a base64 base uh, value, and using that as the key. So, um, so since we're already using something that's not an uh, auto-incrementing ID, then it is the primary key. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot more about why uh, that is a, a good choice for this particular table. But uh, that is pretty much the pattern that we'll see for, um, for using alternate keys in every single table. Uh, and so the reason that we're using an alternate key uh, for every table is that that is the identity that we share with the rest of the world. We never share the, the ID that's uh, um, automatically generated and used as the primary key. And so if you were to think about it, um, so like every time you would want to talk about a show, you would use the show GUID. So let's go back here and uh, say, OK, we're going to edit uh, the Jeff Foxworthy show. Um, when I hit edit, I get uh, show and then an ID that's part of the URL. So that's the show GUID. In a lot of systems, this would be a number, you know, show 47, you know, show 512. Um, and that's that's uh, really not a great solution for a number of reasons. Um, the, uh, the, the first of which is that you can just simply scan those IDs and you can pull back information that maybe you, you you know, shouldn't have access to. You should already have security mechanisms in place for that, but so why allow that to happen? Why leak information about how many records are in your database? But that's not the important reason. That's not the that's not the big one. The big one is that this uh, GUID um, can be generated by the client, or at the very least, it can be generated before we have posted back to the server to say, "Hey, create this show." And so, why is that important? Well, if you think about the way that you would typically write a post uh, in an API, I'm going to post to this endpoint, and now I want you to insert something into a database, and then uh, grab the ID of the thing you just inserted, and now you return that. You know, maybe you put that in the URL, so now I've got show slash 513, and you return that uh, in your post response message. Well, what if the client doesn't hear that? What if the message is lost on the way back. Um, maybe uh, the uh, the browser is just kind of spinning there for a while, and the user gets uh, gets frustrated and, and gets impatient, and they push the button again. So now you've just sent another post. There's no way for the server to know that this is a duplicate of the same post, and so it's going to do another insert. You're going to duplicate uh, the results of the uh, of that operation, and you're going to get back another identifier. So here comes, you know, 517. I forget which number I was on. But um, so by using an alternate uh, ID, by using a show good, 
we're actually able to solve that don't click submit twice problem. We're able to solve um, the, the problem that's mathematically called the item potency problem. So uh, let me show you um, what, uh, what happens when we add a show. Well, look, there's a show good. Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, let me, let me cancel that and add another one. Okay, there's a different show good. All right, now let me just hit back and then add another one. And so you can kind of see um, there's, there's a, a, a bug that uh, I've kind of left in here to, to show you what's going on. Um, when, I, when I cancel and hit add show, I'm getting a new show good. Just hitting back and add show, I get the same one. And that's because this add show button right here, if I, uh, well, actually, let me, let me show it to you inside the code. We're going to pop into one of the pages. This is just a Razor Pages uh, application. So here's our index. And here's our button to add the show. So it's just creating a new good and keeping that as part of the URL for the button. So whenever somebody pushes that button, that's the show ID that they're about to create. So that means if I were to come in here, uh, let's uh, let's add a show, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and do the uh, the Julio Iglesias uh, show, and uh, so now if I um, if I hit add and things take a while, um, I can hit add again and I won't duplicate anything. So, uh, yeah, I'm not running it in the debugger. So, um, I've, I double clicked on add. I don't know if I hit it fast enough, but, uh, it doesn't matter how slow the server was or how fast I clicked that button. It's always trying to insert the same object. So it's checking, uh, just by the very fact that it's using that alternate key, whether I've already done the insert. And so I'm doing an item potent uh, operation on my database. So that's the the primary reason um, I think for um, for using uh, external IDs rather than internal IDs is that you're able to identify your object completely before you've even talked to the server. You don't have to wait for the identity to be created there and come back. In general, you can say that if you're waiting for a specific uh, database to create an identity for you, then that identity is dependent upon that location. I call that location dependent identity. And so this way, identity is now location independent. Everybody who's talking about this show, GUID, has the same idea in mind. They're talking about the same show. But if you insert a record into one database or insert it into another, you're going to get a different ID. It's going to mean a different thing. And uh, it also means that now you are dependent upon that particular location to be there, you are dependent upon the topology of your system. And uh, that's one of my favorite uh, fallacies of distributed computing is that uh, topology doesn't change. Well, I uh, uh, mentioned active-active uh, database failover before. That's one way in which the topology could change. You could switch from one to the, un uh, to the other. With this mechanism, you're not going to um, get one ID and then use it in a different database, um, or you won't uh, uh, be waiting on an ident identity when you get switched over when you try to duplicate and uh, retry that and hit a different database. It'll all work out. So for the show, the show ID is your external identity. Um, but now for the show description, remember our alternate key was the show ID, that's the foreign key, and the modified date. Well, the show ID isn't an external identity. It's still just an internal, you know, it's a foreign key. It's an integer. So um, what we do is we map that integer back to the show good before we uh, give that show description out. So every time we're talking about the, uh, the show description externally, it's that pair, that coupling of uh, show good and modified date. That's the external ID uh, identity of a show description. Similar for show removed, it's a show good and the removed date. Uh, and for content, it's just the hash. And uh, we'll get into that one in a little bit more detail. 
All right, so we have a question from Scott. Do you run the insert in a transaction to ensure that the show table is updated with the content table? That is an excellent question. And uh, as it turns out in this particular case, I am playing it fast and loose and I do not, but let me, let me show you why that is okay. So here's the um, show command. So here is the, um, the add show. I'm just going to uh, get or insert by the show good. And so um, get or insert, you might be familiar with insert or update. Get or insert is the pattern that you tend to fall into when you're um, doing immutable architectures is uh, you're going to first check the show repository, the show table, and see if you've got a show GUID by this particular GUID. So you're going to check the alternate key. And you're going to try to get it by its alternate key. Since it's an alternate key, we can get single or default. We know that we're not going to have duplicates. There's a database enforced uniqueness constraint. So, um, so now if I don't have a show, I'm going to go ahead and insert one. And the only thing that I'm setting is that alternate key, that show ID. Um, but if I do have a show, then I'm just going to return it. So this is getting the existing one or inserting uh, a new one. So that means if I, if I duplicate this uh, request, the first time through, it's not going to be there. It's going to insert it. The second time through, it's just going to get that row back. So get or insert show for the same show ID is always going to say return the same show. So that's the the first thing that uh, um, that makes this OK. The second thing is now here we are setting the show description. And uh, so when we uh, set the show description, we are going to get or insert the show. And then we're going to uh, do some logic here that we're going to get into in a little bit and see if we need to add the show description. If we do. Um, then we create that show description and we set the image hash. So that means that we have to already have this image hash by the time we get here. Um, if we take a look at where set show description is called, so here's our actual uh, call to it. Um, I am going to get the image hash here. Uh, so get the uh, the hash of the image, and uh, I am also going to da -da -da, save the contents. So um, so get image hash is actually yeah sorry poorly named. It's it's doing two things. It's getting and it's inserting, um, but it is uh, um, saving the the contents to the uh, the content table. So. Think about what uh, you know, what would happen if you um, uh, if you were to duplicate this um, and and things start to happen you know, in in, in kind of over each other. You're not inside of a transaction. So the first time through here, you're going to um, check to see and save contents uh, is also following the um, the insert or update uh, or the the select. I'm sorry, <laughs> the select or insert pattern. Um, uh, so it's just inserting if it doesn't uh, already exist. So the first time that uh, you try to save the contents, it will save it to the uh, the table. And then the second time through, it's already there, uh, so it'll be fine. Um, and then on the uh, the other insert, it's going to try to insert the um, uh, the uh, information and uh, and put the hash into that table. And uh, again, uh, it'll insert the first time. But the second time through, it uh, it won't. So if you don't have these in a transaction and you end up just inserting the contents but not the uh, uh, the info, so you just have orphan contents out there. But then the next time when the user try retries, uh, or you've got a retry on the client side, um, now you get the uh, uh, the request again, and so now you're able to insert the contents with the same hash. So you're not duplicating the um, uh, the uh, the content. Uh, so, if you uh, if you want to look for any um, any instances of uh, orphan contents, you can just simply look for 
uh, content where the hash is not used in any of the places where it should be. Um, and you can uh, keep things clean if that's uh, the thing that you're concerned about there. But, uh, but yeah, in general, um, not uh, absolutely necessary to use a transaction in order to protect these two inserts. But excellent, excellent question. All right. I mean, so, really, that that's mm -hmm. a that, that that's a great use for queues, right? Like you could you could keep retrying something over and over again, and then mm -hmm. you know, once it's delivered, you're good. But yeah, I think I think the lack of necessity of transactions is a big point there. That's really worth pondering. Yeah, yeah, and especially if you think about now, hey, if I've got maybe my content uh, management system isn't the same database. Maybe I'm using a Redis cache. Maybe I'm using a CDN. Um, then you know, doing a distributed transaction over those two stores is going to get really expensive. Uh, if you can avoid that, that's uh, all for the better. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. So kind of summing up the alternate keys discussion, um, <clears throat> this can prevent duplicates by uh, checking for those, uh, uh, those uh, retries and uh, and acting in an idempotent fashion. Uh, and this uh, transcends location. It's, uh, it's location independent because now the alternate key is the same no matter which copy you're talking about, whereas the uh, auto-incrementing IDs can be different. And you're no longer uh, waiting for the server to generate the ID for you before you can start using it. So you are completely independent of location. Um, so you always include the foreign key as part of the alternate key. But then when you're talking to the outside world, you're going to replace that foreign key with the alternate key of that table and just kind of go up the chain. Um, then you follow the selector insert pattern. Um, you never share that primary key with the outside world. Always replace it with the alternate key. And uh, the client is able to produce those identifiers. So. Um, uh, in, in this case, the server was producing it when it put it into the add button, and then the client now um, uh, retained it. The, um, you know, a, a, an even better way to do that is for the, the client through JavaScript to just say, hey, you're good, and use that one. Um, or if it's a mobile device, it can generate IDs. Um, that way, you can, you can create a whole bunch of uh, records, even if you're offline, and uh, those identifiers are just as good. Uh, they are they are created in a way that is independent of the uh, the target location. Okay, so uh, the next topic is snapshots. So let's talk about how we're going to do inserts to represent updates. Um, so kind of coming back here, we've got our um, our records here. I can uh, hit, uh, hit edit on one of these records, and let's uh, let's change the uh, the date for Jeff Foxworthy, and uh, and save that back. And so we've got the uh, the update that has taken place. So I want to uh, perform that operation, but I want to do that in a way that just uses inserts. And so the way I'm going to do that in this system is um, is Kind of a, a starting pattern. I know that uh, there are, there are those in the audience that are already familiar with the uh, the more advanced pattern. Like, why are you even showing us this? Um, this this is this is a great place to start. And um, for uh, for a lot of systems, I you know, just keep it like this. But uh, so we've got um, here is our show description. So you know this just simply refers to the uh, the show. So there's the foreign key and the navigation property and the modified date. So that's the alternate key. And then there's all of the, um, the information about the show. And so when I want to, uh, to see, well, what is the current state of this show? What, you know, what is the actual title city uh, date? Um, in order to do that, I am going to run a little query. So here's our content queries. Uh, not content queries, the show queries, sorry. Um, so, so here. This, this one, well, let's look at the, uh, the get show version of it. They're, the list shows and the get show are, are pretty similar, but uh, get show, it's, uh, we're pulling back the record for one particular show ID. So we are going into the shows. Um, 
and finding the one where the distro ID matches our uh, parameter there. And then here we are grabbing all of the descriptions of that uh, of that show and ordering them by descending modified date and just taking first year default. So if you haven't saved a, uh, a description yet, then you're going to get back null. If you have, you get back the most recent one. Um, so that gives you back the description. Now here in, in Entity Framework, notice I'm doing all of this um, before I've done my finalization operator here, my uh, the thing that realizes the results. So at the very end here, I'm doing singular defaults. So I'm grabbing the um, the instance of the uh, the record that I projected it into into here that has the show and one description in it. Um, and so that means that Entity Framework is going to take this and turn it into a single query and execute that query and then give me back that uh, projection. And now I can take that projection and I can map it back to an actual show description. So this is just you know, a simple left to right mapping. No auto mapper here. Uh, we're, just, we're just mapping it back to a show description model. Um, and, and so the important thing is that we're doing with this query a, um, a, a query for the most recent version of that uh, information. So that means when I want to change the information, then I just issue a command, uh, set show description. So now here I've got the show. And uh, we're going to go over this logic here in a little bit. But uh, assuming that things have changed, then I'm just going to add a new show description, UTC now, just um, yeah, now as far as the server is concerned. So um, so this is just going to keep a history of every time uh, somebody has uh, hit save and it's going to um, then when we when we query, we're going to get back the most recent one. So um, this uh, this might be something that uh, that you're a little bit concerned about uh, the performance of. How is this? How is that query going to turn into SQL? Let me show you again the show query. So here's the show query where we're getting the, uh, the first or defaults by modified date. And so what, uh, what Entity Framework is going to generate for you is something that's actually pretty clever. So um, it's going to do a row number uh, over the uh, show description table and partition that road number by the show ID. So basically put them in order by show ID and modified date. And every time show ID changes, it starts over again. So now here it's just grabbing the one where show uh, where the row number is one. And that is the most recent one. So this query, not, not, uh, not the, uh, the fastest query that you would do, not uh, one that would just simply select the show and give you back the uh, information, but, uh, but it's not too bad. The, uh, the thing that uh, might make it even better is for you to, um, to actually create an index that looks very similar to this partition statement. So if you were to create an index on show ID and modified date descending, then this query uh, is uh, actually a, a, a little bit better. So um, in fact, if we take a look at the migrations, we'll see this very last one right here does exactly that. So there's no way to express this particular index in um, the Entity Framework model itself. You just have to write it in SQL. So I just wrote it in the, uh, uh, in the migration. So by show ID ascending and modify date descending. And now it's able to, um, to just seek to the first show ID in that index. And now it has that information. And in fact, I included the information. So now this is a covering index. And it's able to execute that query just from this index. So it, uh, it, it works pretty well. It, uh, um, it's, it's fast enough for um, the, the, the types of uh, uh, systems that, uh, that we typically will build. And as an advantage, it keeps all of that history, which is uh, valuable for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that, uh, that now we can go back and, and see who changed what, when, and, and uh, you know, keep track of, of all that. But, uh, but it also helps us in, uh, in a few um, 
technical ways uh, that, that we're about to go over. And you got to love the top two trick for single or default. It's like, oh, yes, single or default. But yeah, yes. no, it's a top two. And it makes sense when you think about it. But at first you kind of, what? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you know when you're supposed to throw an exception? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's an efficient way of handling it, but it's not intuitive at first. Yep. Yep. And all of that SQL generated by any framework. I mean, it's it's gotten pretty good at... Uh, it's uh, generating some, I mean, it's probably not SQL that you would think to to write yourself, but if you take a look at the, the query plan, it does a pretty good job of what it, uh, it's supposed to do. So um, so there's, there's an interesting thing that could happen. Uh, so we were talking about things being out of sync and why you want to use immutability in order to, uh, to make sure that every copy is just as good as every other copy. Uh, let's suppose that uh, I'm editing uh, the uh, Jeff Dunham uh, show here. I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this tab. And now I've got uh, this um, edit happening in parallel along two separate paths. Uh, neither path knows about the other. So um, so yeah, in, uh, in one, uh, I'm going to you know, move them to, to Dallas and then and the other, I'm going to change the uh, the date. So now these two are two completely separate edits, um, and uh, and so they happen concurrently. Neither one knew about the other. Um, I don't even have to be terribly fast on the save button to create a problem here. So let's go ahead and save the one where I've uh, changed the date. And so there we've got our date change, um, and then. I'm going to come back here and I'll save the one where we changed the city. And what happens is that a, uh, a new update uh, has occurred since you loaded this page. So you should refresh and try again. Um, so we know that we just changed the, uh, the city. So I'm just going to, uh, to reload this page. And now we've brought the new date in here and I can change uh, the city and save and everything's good. So we have just um, checked for those concurrent changes. And in general, I'm a big fan of allowing concurrent changes to happen. And immutability in general solves for that. But remember, um, we are um, we're going back to a single database uh, right here. And we are um, taking the most recent um, by modified date from that particular database. So this query is already dependent upon that location. Um, this form of keeping track of history is already bound up to a single database. So if you are willing to, um, to accept that and to, to recognize that you have just, um, you've just relied upon topology in order to solve this problem, then, um, then you can uh, do this in order to, uh, to capture those concurrent changes. And so the way that we're doing that is in the show command. That is uh, setting that show description. It is uh, coming in with our show description model. And this was the model that was populated when we loaded that show and uh, put it on the screen. Um, so that show description model has uh, all of the information that the user has entered. Uh, and then it also has the last modified date in ticks. So it's just converting that date time into a long. Um, so now this is just a monotonically increasing number. Um, and so if we go to the database and we get the most recent by modified date, and its modified date in ticks is different from the one that they loaded, now we know that a, a concurrent update has occurred and we prevent that update. So um, if you were to think about this and say, OK, well, what if we've got the active-active scenario? What if we've got two different databases? This is actually right here calling out a problem that would occur with this decision of, uh, of using snapshots as, um, uh, as a, a record-keeping uh, history. And that is that um, you you might miss that concurrent changes have happened 
uh, if they're happening in two different databases. So I get information from here. I, uh, I uh, you want to save back a new version. So here's the new version. And that was the last modified that I read. And it's like, okay, that was the most recent one I had here. Meanwhile, in this replica, I've pulled uh, that same record, written it back with the same last modified date, and it was allowed to be inserted there. But now these two have um, you know, have uh, different modified dates, and so when they uh, when they merge, the last write is going to win and clobber the uh, uh, the one before it. So if you are okay with all of that, and honestly, uh, sometimes. I am. In fact, the uh, the project I'm working on right now is following exactly this uh, this pattern, and uh, for the most part, it's going to be one database. And if we end up clobbering uh, some data in those those rare uh, circumstances, we're willing to uh, to accept that risk. Um, a different project that I worked on um, that was. Uh, that was a law enforcement application, and so um, there was a, a really strict um, chain of custody rule about uh, who could change the data, and uh, then after it was changed, it had to be uh, it had to be vetted. So you would have data in the system that other people can't see yet until it's been vetted and then um, approved. So concurrent changes happened a lot more frequently, and clobbering data was a lot worse. So in that system. We didn't go with this mechanism. Uh, we went with something that was uh, a bit more complicated. But for that one, you're going to have to check out the book. This is this is a good place to start. So that's how we will simulate uh, updates in an immutable architecture. We'll just keep track of snapshots. So the date is part of the alternate key. That way, you can have multiple versions of the uh, the same entity, um, and then uh, you can uh, you order by the date descending and pull the uh, the top one in order to get the uh, the most recent version. You can do a concurrency check by sending back the modified date of the record that you read, and this depends upon having that centralized topology. So you must keep that in mind if you're going to choose this solution. All right, uh, any other? Questions here before we move on to the next. No? I'm ready to go rewrite my code for work. <laughs> oh, and, well, and just wait to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you think it's bad now. Just wait. Mm. Yeah, this is this is this is definitely starter. This is uh, yeah. This is very rudimentary, yeah. honestly. And uh, I mean, it's <laughs> great. It's a great introduction, but there's so much depth and and yeah. Anyway. All right, so the next thing that you're going to want to do, if you can update records, you're going to want to be able to delete them, but we can't delete things. So what do you do? You have a tombstone. When, uh, when you're done with the object, you just mark it as done. Uh, and so in, in a lot of systems, you'll mark a record as deleted by um, setting a flag. So you'll have a little flag and you can delete it. So you'll select uh, where deleted is false, and you'll get just the, uh, um, the records that aren't deleted. Uh, but there's a problem with that in an immutable architecture. Um, that's an update, and we don't allow updates. So, um, so what are you going to do? So, you know, uh, you know, Julio Iglesias. I'm afraid he's really not going to be coming to Dallas. So we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, remove that show, and it no longer appears on this page. So, it's okay for that record to be in the database as long as it's not returned from this query. And that's the same strategy that uh, is used by that, uh, that update flag. Um, but we can also uh, do that same strategy, but with an insert instead of an update. And so we will do that if we have our uh, show commands. Yep, that's where we run. And we want to remove a show. So um, what we're first going to do is get or insert the show by this show good. And then we're going to add a show removed object. So we're just going to insert into the show remove table with that show and this remove date. So we're going to remove it as of right now. So the first thing that uh, might be a little bit surprising to you is we're trying to remove a show, but what if we don't have that show GUID yet in our database? We're actually going to end up inserting it just so that we can turn around and 
remove it. That seems kind of weird. Yeah, but think about if um, if this record was uh, you know sent to one replica of the database that didn't yet have had it didn't have that show yet, and so you insert the show and you insert the show removed. Oh, well, let's suppose you optimized and you said, well, it's not here anyway, so I'm just going to do nothing. But then that's a replica. This other database already has that show, and so replicate over, and now the show reemerges. It appears. But uh, if you capture the show uh, ID, the show, the show good, and the fact that it was removed, now when you replicate the removal back, every <clears throat> everybody knows that it's been removed. So I'm reminded of um, back in the days when I had a, uh, a Windows mobile device. Uh, this was even back before Windows Phone, may it rest in peace. Uh, um, the Windows mobile device uh, that I had was running something called Active Sync. And I could um, put it on a cradle that was attached via RS-232 to the back of my PS2. And that wasn't a PlayStation. That was actually a computer. And the um, uh, and and then Outlook would uh, would pop up and it would you know, talk to Exchange and uh, pull my contacts down and, and push them up. And <clears throat> without fail, on the device, uh, I would say, OK, I need to edit somebody's phone number. So let's. Uh, edit that and I'm using a stylus because they were stylus devices at the time. And then on the computer, I would say, nah, I need to delete that contact. So you have a delete happening here and an update happening here. When they sync up, the contact just magically came back. I was like, no, that wasn't the intent. The intent was to delete it. An update plus a delete is a delete. And this um, this pattern here captures that. It's uh, it's capturing that the show was removed. I don't care if there are any new show descriptions. The show was, was removed. So this is really um, uh, taking the user's intent and just writing that to the database. So what does that look like for the query side? So here we're going to um, grab all the shows while we list the shows where the show removed any is false. So what's this show removed thing? This is the navigation property that is looking at the list of shows removed that refer to this show. It's uh, it's it's a little bit a um, little bit tricky to see from here. So let me go ahead and pull up. This was the whole reason that I told you about GraphViz. Um, let's uh, let's pull up a a graph and let's let's walk through it. So here I'm going to create model.gv. Um, so if you're if you're following along, you can create uh, after you've installed this uh, extension, you can create a file uh, called .vgv for graphviz, and then when you um, so start it with digraph directed graph, and when you open preview to the side, now you've got a little snapshot of your directed graph. So um, yeah, this tool allows you to do some stuff like this, A arrow B, and then it shows A with an arrow pointing to B. Um, all arrows should be pointing up. So digraph, uh, or I'm sorry, rank dir, uh, the rank direction is from the bottom to the top. So A points up to B. OK. So what we've actually got going on here is we have a show, and uh, then um, there's a show uh, description. So that's uh, that's a, a show description record. Um, and then we've got a show removed. So these are our three tables that we're talking about. And so the relationship here is that show description points to show and show removed points to show. So um, you insert a, uh, a show and now you can insert descriptions as you update that show and you insert removed the tombstone whenever you want to remove that show. So um, if you um, if you happen to have done both, you know, one person updated, the other person removed, then this query right here is going to check the associated show removed table for anything that has a foreign key to this object. And if it exists, it simply will not return it from this query. 
So it's still in the database. We're still keeping track of that history. We just don't show it uh, to the user. And then we're still going through this, uh, get the most recent description and map it to the show description. So that's oh, yeah. how we so, uh, update our view. Yes. That uh, graph is digraph rendering tool will wreck you. <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's like an infinitely tall bottomless pit. You, you, once I found it and started thinking in terms of mutability, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't, I can't like render anything without thinking about this now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, when uh, when talking with my team, we start in GraphViz. Mm -hmm. So, so we're talking about, hey, here's this new feature that we're going to build for the system. Uh, okay, let's mm -hmm. let's talk about all of the decisions. Uh, I'm sorry, was that a question? That was, uh, I, I don't think so. Oh, I muted, okay. I muted it though. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're thinking through what are the decisions that the uh, users are going to be making? You know, so, um, so they're going to be doing things that are navigating around. So add show is just really navigation. Um, yeah, you know, hitting edit from here, hitting remove from here. These are all navigations. That remove button, however, that's a decision. That's something we want to record. Um, so we think through with this feature, what are the decisions that they're going to be making? And every single one of those decisions gets one of these, um, you know, one of these bubbles here. It gets a, uh, it gets a table. It gets, um, uh, it, uh, it gets uh, an entity within that table. So. Um, so we're thinking through those decisions and how they're related to one another. So before I can decide to um, order this uh, this product, I must first put it into my cart. So add to cart is one decision. Ordering it is another one that points back to add to cart in some way. So these uh, these arrows become a really important part of analyzing the flow of of uh, the user's decisions through the system. Um, and so. Um, I call these decisions facts because they are a historical fact that somebody has made this decision. And then these arrows, um, I call them uh, the predecessors. So the arrow points back to the predecessor fact, the one that came before. Uh, and so now you can build this, uh, this chain of related facts, related decisions that led to the current state of the system. And so, yeah, we're starting here in GraphViz and we're modeling this out. And then it becomes a mechanical process. We can take each one of these, turn it into an entity uh, in uh, Entity Framework, and then every single arrow, we turn that into a foreign key, usually with a navigation property, and then you just build it from there. Um, and, and the immutable uh, data structure emerges. So yeah, this is the starting, uh, starting point. Michael, we've got a question from Craig. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. So I'm scrolling back up. Uh, it should be the last thing on there now. Oh, okay. Okay. So third from the last now. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So uh, I like the built-in audit log solves a lot of the how uh, did the data get like that troubleshooting. Excellent. But if I'm required to purge data, example to delete due to industry regulations after a period of time, it seems like this is a non-starter or do you make exceptions for those requirements? Excellent, excellent point. So there are a, a few things that you can do in order to purge for regulatory um, uh, compliance. The um, yeah the the so so let's first of all draw a diagram of what what that looks like. So you have a um, a a person that is coming to a chat program and talking with other people. So um, so here's your your user. And um, this is a chat room that they uh, have come to join. And uh, we might need to, to zoom out a bit. Uh, well, we'll just comment these out for a bit. There we go. Now we can just focus on this one. So, um, so our user is joining a chat room. Uh, so they make the decision to join the chat room. User. Uh, uh, so this this join idea is that they have joined the user has joined the chat room. Okay, so they've joined and then they want to send a message. So 
a message is a decision that a user has made in a chat room. So, um, so now you've got this, uh, this history of these are all the messages that this user left in this chat room. Um, so now the user leaves the, um, the system and they say, I need you to delete all of my data. One way that you can do that is if you delete the user record. So now um, keep in mind, immutable is a decision that we've made as designers that we are not going to allow our application to update or to delete information. It's not necessarily a constraint that we have to impose on our infrastructure itself. So we can decide and then understand the consequences of that decision to allow our database administrator to run a delete statement in the database. Um, and so we can set up these cascading delete rules where um, when you delete a user, it's going to cascade through and it's going to delete all the join records. It's going to delete all the messages, just the messages that that user posted, but not other, um, uh, that not what other um, users have posted in that chat room. Uh, or if you've got a private method message. So this is from one user to another user. So this uh, private message, not inside of a chat room, it's just what one user sent to another. If you delete the sender, you're gonna delete the private message. Delete the recipient, you delete the private message. So you delete all of the information related to that user um, and just do the, the cascading delete. Um, so that cascading delete is an operation uh, known as a transitive closure over the um, that successor relationship. So you're deleting uh, not just the object, but all of its successors. So that's one solution. Um, now, the consequences of that solution is that if you have a replica, you have to somehow manage to do that cascading delete in all your replicas in order to be compliant. Um, <clears throat> if those replicas are caches uh, or if there are mobile phones that are in somebody else's pocket, um, that can become a, um, a, a very difficult task indeed. Um, and so another solution, uh, one that I prefer, is to do a cryptographic shredding uh, operation. So in this particular uh, uh, system, you can imagine that every user has a public key. Uh, and so every one of their messages is signed using that public key. Um, every one of their private messages uh, signed using their public, public key. And then when somebody sends a message to them encrypted using their, uh, their public key so that only they can decrypt it with their private key. Um, so take one extra step. Um, let's make sure that every chat room now has a symmetric key associated with it. And, um, and then uh, every time the user post a message to a chat room, we go ahead and encrypt that message using that chat room. And now only people who have that symmetric key can have access to it. That symmetric key can be encrypted for them and stored inside of the join fact. So only they can decrypt the symmetric key uh, for that particular room from that join uh, using their private key. Um, so take it one step further. And let's say that uh, every time that um, uh, that somebody joins a chat room, they get a brand new symmetric key that is just for them. And so now all of their information is encrypted using that symmetric key. So while that symmetric key exists, the server can decrypt it and give it back to anybody who asks. But as soon as you shred that key, as soon as you delete just that key from your database, now um, it uh, it becomes a, 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 a you know, a nearly intractable problem to figure out what that key was and to reconstruct that information. So, um, so that cryptographic shredding is able to delete a whole bunch of information uh, by just simply making it inaccessible uh, because you deleted the, uh, the key that was used to encrypt it. So excellent, excellent question. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah Jeff uh, mentioned the key shredding is likely the best option. So I'm going to scroll back up and just make sure that we didn't uh, miss anything here. Um, performance and concurrency. So uh, I'm not sure what that was in referring to, but um, uh, yes, yeah, so 
we are um, we are optimizing for concurrency with an immutable architecture, and then trying to win back some of the performance that we've uh, that we've given up. There are um, you know, there are definitely period offs, um, and using the indexes like uh, like what I showed you, you can get back some of the performance. Um, and to that end, I do want to take a look at what this query turns into and see what uh, what kind of performance uh, impact this query has. So this is our um, our get list or get shows query. So it gets the list of all shows um, and uh, the, the most recent uh, modified date. And here it's got this where not exists clause. So it's saying, I only want the shows where there does not exist a show removed with this show ID. So this is doing an extra join uh, in order to figure out, should I actually return this show? So where not exists is definitely a query that you'll want to pay attention to uh, from a performance uh, perspective. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the decision point is really, um, is this something that you expect very few of the records to ever be deleted, or do you expect most of them to be deleted? And you're going to make a different decision uh, based on the, uh, the answer there. So in this case, if I'm going to do a lot of inserts, but then very few deletes, um, then what this is basically going to turn into, um, since we're already doing a select everything from the, uh, the show table, this is going to turn into a table scan of, of show, but it's also going to be scanning right along there uh, with it in parallel show removed. So you know, it's going to keep on going through and then it says, oh, the, the next show removed record is the one that I'm on now. So let me go ahead and skip it and move forward. And then go to the next show ID, keep going. Oh, okay, skip that one and move forward. So it's doing two scans in parallel. So it's it's not any worse than the original table scan. And it's just eliminating some of the uh, some of the results. But if you expect to delete most of the records, then this is a very poor performing query. So you're going to be scanning you know, the tables and they're go both going to be going down and hitting most rows. And then finally, uh, so, oh, that one doesn't exist. Let me return that one row. And meanwhile, you've scanned all of this stuff. So that's the sort of thing that might happen if the record represents work that needs to be done, and then the removal represents that you did that work. You're going to expect to eventually do all of the work. So it's like, yep, everything's done, everything's done, everything's done. Okay, this is the next one to do. Um, and then you're not going to get very good performance out of this. So there are other uh, optimizations that uh, that I cover in the book that uh, you could do to, um, to uh, solve this one. The Best one, I think, for this particular uh, problem that we're trying to solve here is, let's get this back. Uh, it's what I call the period pattern. It's a pattern that shows up an awful lot. Um, so let's think about, hey, we're, we're doing shows. We're promoting the shows. Shows happen at a particular point in time. And then we don't care about them anymore. We don't care about show, past shows. We're not selling tickets for those. So we're going to remove every show from the system eventually because it's eventually going to happen. So this is one of those scenarios where most things get deleted. So hey, maybe this was not a great, uh, a great decision. Except what I can do is I can put another clock into the system. And every time that clock ticks, now I get a brand new period that I've started. And uh, for this, I'll call that period the season. So we are promoting uh, the the summer season of uh, of shows, and so uh, now we're we're adding those to the uh, to the system. And those days are going to kind of flow by through the summer. But then when the summer's done, every show in the summer season is done, and I don't have to query those anymore. So I only have to query the current season and the next season and maybe the season after that. I've got a small number of seasons, and that means I'm starting my query from a smaller number of shows. So now removing a show, um, you know, it, it's happening more rarely, and uh, you're not eventually removing every show. So by applying uh, patterns like this, you can um, win back some of the performance, but you're also 
capturing some really important information in the model. You know, seasons are an important part of this problem domain to begin with. So let's go ahead and model them. And that's an example of the period pattern that uh, shows up so frequently. Okay, so it looks like that is everything about tombstones. So the date is part of the alternate key, just like with the snapshots. Um, you do a select where not exists. Oh, but we didn't talk about the coolest one. Oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. Oh, I deleted that show. I didn't mean to. I need to restore it. What do I do? What do I do? Yeah, do this. Call the DBA and <laughs> see if they can restore it for the backup. <laughs> oh, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, do that. You, you have a problem. You <laughs> decide to call the DBA. You now have 5,000 problems. <laughs> Wrap it in a start procedure. <laughs> or you can do this restored. It's a really big shoe. <laughs> so your, um, your show restored record uh, now is a successor of show removed. And so that's basically doing the opposite there. So you remove the show. Now you insert a new show restored in order to remove the removal. <laughs> so, so you end up doing a uh, select where not exists, where not exists. Uh, so you go one level deeper in order to, now when you've inserted that show restored, it, the show removed no longer affects the query. And so now the show comes back. So when you remove the restored show? Excellent question. So what do you do? Do you keep on chain, chaining things down uh, yeah, this, this rabbit hole? I doubt that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that would be a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> instead, um, show removed. Remember, that has... If I switch back here. Here's my removed, show removed. That has the removed date. So that means you can insert another one. You can remove it again. Yeah. You don't have to remove the restore. The show restored would just have as its alternate key, the show removed ID. It would not have a, a date. It doesn't need one because it doesn't need to disambiguate. When you restore it, okay, that particular removal no longer takes effect, but you can create another one and that'll be just fine. Just make sure your show removed has a date or you can only remove it yeah. and restore it once. <laughs> yep. And no, let's try to remove it again. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. it. You're done. It's over. <laughs> nice. I like it. Yeah, you see you're getting your audit log for free. Like uh, I mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. Someone in the chat. Yeah, Craig mentioned that. Cool. So now let's he, talk about and, oh, go ahead. real quick before you switch over. Okay. I, I, I mean, I hopefully everybody can see the the mathematical logic behind this as well, right? The where not exists, the where exists, or the double where not exists. I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of you know, it, it's it's very based in, in in set theory, and I think that's really helpful. Just mm -hmm. having that mathematical foundation behind all of this. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I managed to put together a presentation that doesn't actually go into CRDTs and-, and uh... I know you did, and here I am trying to drive you there. <laughs> Tell me to stop it, I'll stop. Yeah, I know, I know. No, it's great, I love the simplicity, but the book yeah. definitely goes deeper, right? Yeah, in fact, the, the presentation that I've been using to promote the book was called ACID 2.0, and that's all about um, the, uh, uh, the, the mathematical properties of the- um, uh, the that yeah you're, you're you're dragging me down that uh anyway that was a very mathematical talk and i'm yeah. like you know what i'm going to do one that's just just all practical because this is really the the conversation that i have with my teammates when we first start a uh, a project mm -hmm. and they haven't worked with me before i was like well here are some advantages and these are my defaults and and i would like to start here and so usually they're like yeah let's give it a shot and oh wait a minute we ran into a problem it's okay i've run into that problem before there's a solution. All right. Um, so the uh, the next one, this one, just you know, when I first discovered it, it just just blew me away. Um, so content addressable storage. Uh, the idea here is that you want to identify large objects 
by their contents. Their content is their identity. Um, and by the way, this doesn't apply just to large objects, but we'll get into that later. Um, so imagine that um, you have a, a, a digital camera. Uh, and in fact, this has happened to me. I'm, I'm sitting with my, um, with my mom and uh, I've got her digital camera and I hooked it up to her computer. And she's like, okay, I want you to take the, the photos off of there and, and uh, put them over here. And it's like, okay, you know, plug them in and all these photos are on, their, on her camera. And she's like, no, just these. I already copied those other photos off. Well, but they're still on your camera. Yeah, but I don't trust the computer. I want to back them up on the camera as well. I want to keep them there. And, but you already put them into different folders. And uh, she's like, well, yeah, I organized my, uh, my photos. Um, and so, yeah, by, you know, when you're finished with that, can you help me to find all of the duplicate photos that are on my hard drive? Well, how'd you get duplicated photos on your hard drive, mom? I mean, that's how it happens. But what if the name of the photo wasn't just a name that the, um, you know, that the, the camera gave it? Or what if it wasn't the path on the hard drive of, of, uh, of uh, names or the name that, uh, that mom changed it to when she said, oh, okay, that's, uh, you know, that's Kayla and on pumpkin day. Okay, so that's the name of the photo. What if it wasn't that? What if the identity of the photo was the contents? Now it would be really easy to see to find duplicates because they have the same name. And that's what, a content, uh, what content addressable storage is all about. So the example here is uh, these, these photos that are uh, attached to the shows. So I can come in here and I can edit and uh, choose a, uh, a different photo. Yeah, Jeff is uh, looking pretty good these days. So um, what, uh, what happens when you, when you take a look at that, you will see, uh, let me go ahead and inspect that element. You'll see that uh, this is image source. Uh, I'll go ahead and open this in another tab. Uh, oh, I can just right click and open in another tab on a, right here, can't I? So open a new tab. So you can see that it is uh, content. And then this big old long string of, uh, of characters. This is a base64 encoded um, string uh, representing the hash of this image. So that means if I were to upload this image again, it would be the same string. It would be the same, the same hash. If I download an image with this hash, I know it's always going to be the same image. I know that I'm not going to get a newer or older version of it, which means that, uh, that caching can be just awesome. So let me hit, go ahead and uh, turn on, okay, there you are, the network tab. Yep, got network tab open. And I'm gonna turn off disable cache because that's the whole thing I'm trying to show you here. Um, so we refresh and you'll see that um, it has pulled those records and then it served up the image tags with these uh, these uh, locations right here. And it's able to serve that back from disk cache. So it's able to say, yep, you already have this image, just, just show it. And, uh, and we're confident that it's the same image, that it hasn't changed, it's not a new version of it because we're using the hash of the image as the identity not the record number, not, uh, you know, not the show ID. Um, so uh, in fact, when it serves that up, let me go ahead and show you the network call just for that one document. So you will see that uh, it's serving that back with the cache control public max age of a full year. So just cache this, don't worry about it ever going out of date. It's not gonna because we um, are identifying it by the hash. So, um, so that, I mean, that in and of itself is already a, a great reason to use uh, content address storage. But now imagine you're using a, a CDN. So you've got that same image cached in several different places around the world. Um, they all have the same identifier for it. So no matter who's asking and where, they're, where they are, the first cache that they hit that has that uh, that data, they're going to get the correct one, and it's going to be fast. Um, yeah. Also, 
the, fa the place where I first saw um, content addressable storage was in a, um, a system uh, uh, called the, uh, the uh, intergalactic uh, file system, uh, uh, in which, or interplanetary file system, IPFS, anyway. Um, but it's used in blockchain in order to, uh, to take documents. And uh, if you were to store a large document in the blockchain, that's, that's just wasting something that's already rather wasteful, but uh, that's wasting a lot of space. Um, so instead you store the document in the uh, in IPFS and then you take the hash and you put it on the blockchain. And now anybody who pulls that record and says, okay, I want to inspect that document. They just ask IPFS, give me the document with this hash. It goes out and it finds it, returns it to them. And uh, they have that, uh, that object. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a great way to, to manage your large assets. And so what we're doing here, um, here is the content record. So the, um, the uh, key for this, which I have documented right here, uh, here is the, let's see, I was expecting to see the, um, the DB context. Let me find it real quick. Promotion context. Okay. Yeah. So here on model creating, here's our content and it has key, this uh, content hash. So that hash is the key and it's just a string of length 88. Why 88? Well, because I'm using a SHA-512 hash. So 512 bits when you represent that as a base 64 number is uh, um, eight, uh, 88 characters. And uh, there's a little formula that uh, I've got here on the slide that'll help you to convert those. So memorize that formula, but uh, use that hash. Here's the binary. And then I also added the content type. So if you think about it, a particular file only has one content type. I mean, if you upload a PNG, it's a PNG. If you upload a JPEG, it's a JPEG. You're not going to have two things that have the same contents that are different uh, content types. So uh, everything in this table is identified by the content and the content is represented by the hash. So um, in order to, uh, to insert that, here's our content commands. Uh, we just save content. Here's the binary and the content type. Just save it. I'm not giving you the hash. I gave you the binary. So, okay, I'm going to compute the, uh, the hash, turn that, turn that into base64, and then check to see, does it exist? If not, insert it. If it, if it already does, hey, I'm good. Um, by the way, this method is returning the hash just because I need it at the same time in the same place. But even if you're not saving it, you can still com compute the hash and you still have the identity. So cool. Uh, content query, now you're going the opposite direction. I have the hash, I want the content, sure. so you just select it. So that is how we are able to, um, to get just mean cache performance out of the system just by just by using the, the, the hash as the identity. So this is why in Webpack, the, um, the identity of uh, a JavaScript file includes the hash. It's not just a hash buster and it's just you know, a, a, um, a query string parameter. It's actually the name of the file. So it's part of the URL. So you can cache it by that identity. Um, yeah, content address storage should be used in a lot more places. It's awesome. Uh, <laughs> planetary intergalactic. Okay, so to use content address, uh, addressable storage, hash the file, use the hash as the primary key. You can cache it forever. And here's your little formula. So uh, if you want to compute the number of characters you need in order to store the basics for representation, take the number of bits, like 512 for the, five, uh, for the SHA-512, divide by 24, round up. So that's the ceiling function. Then multiply by four. That gives you the number of characters. So. 512 divided by 24, rounded up, times 4 is 88. Um, 
and yeah, just a, just a great uh, uh, solution. So now kind of the teaser is this isn't just for large files. You can also use content addressable storage for facts, just for little tiny records. Take an immutable record, represent it in canonical form, hash it. Uh, now that hash is the identity of that record. So if somebody sends you the same record, you can tell that because you hash it and you look it up. Oh, I already have that one. Item potent operations. So in, uh, in uh, a lot of the immutable systems that I write, I use the hash itself as the identity of the record, not just the um, auto increment and ID. So that's a little extra for you. Cool. Any questions on that before we go on to the last one? No. OK. The but last I rewrite our entire software. <laughs> well, and you know, you can also use content addressable uh, IDs for defining your types, which is a, that's a whole nother layer. Ah, yes. When you read the book, mm -hmm. which you have to buy, but then, yeah. I did. I did. I bought it. I know you did. Well, you bought it on Kindle. Like, come on. You can't take notes. You can't write on that. You can't. Come on. You can actually. You can well, take yeah. I don't know. There's there's a device that I'm looking to get called a Remarkable. Yeah, um, those look really cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get one of those. Can you can you get Kindle books on those? Uh, I don't think so, but uh, but you can load up an EPUB or a PDF. So oh, interesting. Um, but yeah, you can get this in in uh, in EPUB or PDF. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Anywhere. Jack says some pre RDBMS DBs used hashes. Nice. Yeah. Imagine that the yeah. the, the stuff in the back of the closet ends up being cool again. Uh huh. That's the way it always works. Yeah, that was that was a good choice on their part. <laughs> and yeah, you just yeah, you think about think about you've got replicas and they're all yeah you know, identified by hashes. So it's like you know okay, I've got I've got these things to share with you. It's like yeah, got that, got that, got that. Okay, that one's new. Got that, got that. Um, Merkle trees, they're making a comeback. Yeah. Look up Merkle trees. That's location how dependence is things. so easy. So we should just go with <laughs> the other so one. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so commutative messages. Um, <clears throat> so now let's let's say, all right, we um, you know this promotion system's gotten really popular. Now we are putting all of these uh, these things online for people to buy tickets. They're doing all sorts of searches, and so they are searching through SQL uh, against uh, all of our snapshots and only the ones that haven't been removed and only the most recent versions. Oh, that's a nasty SQL query. No, you don't want to do that kind of a, an operation against the immutable records. Bad idea. But what you can do is you can project those records into something that's better for search, like Elasticsearch, for example. And now you can keep the current version and only the ones that have been removed, keep those in Elasticsearch. So what you want to do is every time somebody makes a change, publish a message that goes over to Elasticsearch and it updates the index. OK. But messages don't always arrive in the order that they're sent. What if you have two updates and you only want to index the most recent version? If they arrive out of order, now you've just uh, indexed the wrong version. What are you going to do? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to assure that your message handler commutes. So what do I mean by that? So we're going to leave Festify Promotion and go into Festify Search. Not fully baked out like the way promotion is, but let's imagine a little bit. And we've got a, uh, a couple of handlers here. So the search description handler uh, handles the, uh, uh, the show description event. So this event right here, if I take a look at it, um, it's just, hey, this show good was modified at this date, and here's the information. So you can imagine every time you insert a show description record, also firing off one of these messages. Um, if you want, you could even decouple that. You can fire the message using a trigger. It's OK. It's OK. Triggers are fine. Um, and, uh, and so uh, you're going to have to defend the... <laughs> that position. <laughs> and I, I mean, date time, not date time offset. You're killing me. I don't know. I, I, I know that that OK, that. I can't defend that that decision. You you are correct about that one, but um, 
but then again, all of my date times are in UTC. So yes, I even have uh, my black clock right here is in UTC. The others I haven't updated from daylight saving because I hate daylight saving, but UTC doesn't honor it. So I keep a UTC clock behind me anyway. Um, so all of those are in UTC. Um, so when you handle this event, um, you have no guarantee that it arrived in order. You might have already seen um, a more recent show description. So you have to make sure that you can handle those things even if they arrive out of order. And so um, we're going to do a, a quick little check right here. We're going to go to our index, go to uh, Elasticsearch, and get the show by the show GUID. So back comes the document. And inside of that document, um, I'm going to find a modified date. This isn't the date that we indexed it in Elasticsearch. This is the modified date that came from the event. So we're taking that metadata and we are actually putting that into Elasticsearch. Even though that's not anything that the user is going to search on, we're storing that metadata so that we can now check to see, does the modified date of this particular event, is it greater than the one that I have in my index right now? And if it is, go ahead and update it. Uh, if not, do nothing. Um, if I don't yet have the show, well, now I'm just creating an empty show record that has uh, the modified date of, uh, of you know, uh, the, the beginning of the epoch. So it's going to be earlier than the one that I'm sending in right now. Um, so, so this is just a really simple check um, that, uh, that I can do to make sure that um, the messages are not going to uh, result in a different solution or a different answer if they're applied in a different order. It's just a really simple check, but there's there's some subtlety here. There's some really important things to remember. Uh, first of all, that modified date, that metadata, that has to be carried with the message. That has to be metadata that originated from the change itself. So it's not keeping track of what you know, time it is right now when it's when it happened. It's it's the original modified date. Um, and we are storing that modified date in the target. So, so here, we're not going back to the original server and say, hey, can you, can you tell me, is this the most recent version? Let me go ahead and index that. That's on a different system. Uh, you are dealing only with the uh, uh, Elasticsearch index. And so it has to be stored there. And you look it up there, uh, do your check, and then you write it back. So this is an example of a commutative operation uh, based on that event. So um, you, you have to kind of reason through um, uh, commutivity of the various events to make sure that they uh, commute with one another, uh, the, the handlers of those events commute with one another. And when you start to compare different uh, messages with one another and their different handlers, it, um, you know, so here we're saying that show descriptions commute with other show descriptions. Um, do they commute with show removals? So here, all we're doing is you know, getting the, uh, the show, if it's, uh, if it's in the system, we're going to remove it. Um, does show removal commute with show description? Well, if you think about it, if I receive the removal and then I receive the description, this code isn't, isn't doing the select or insert. Uh, it's not going to create the show. So so that means I can receive the removal and then I can receive the description and it won't end up recreating it. So, so it commutes. Um, uh, so you, you have to kind of think through different pairs of message handlers to see if they commute with one another. But uh, um, as you're thinking through those things, um, you can really think, you can really constrain uh, which pairs you have to think about by coming back to this diagram. So if things are, um, are uh, uh, related to one another, if they have a, a line between them, then that's a causal relationship. So um, the show has to have happened before the show removed. So now you have to think about, OK, what if I you know, learn about the, uh, the show being removed before I learn about the show, and I have to commute those things. Um, things that are not causally related, um, you're going to have um, uh, uh, a lot less um, you know, 
uh, commutivity problems uh, between those two things. So you don't have to think about those quite so much. So, um, so this diagram can really help you to, um, to reason through the commutivity of your messages. But the important parts of these uh, things is that the information comes with the message and you're doing that commutative operation just on the target that you are um, yeah, that you're looking at. So you have to store enough meta information in that target system in order to make sure that it commutes. So kind of in summary there, um, oh, I, I didn't uh, mention here uh, the alternate key. So um, that message was published from the promotion system. Uh, and so the promotion database has the primary keys in it. The message itself doesn't contain the show ID. It contains just the alternate key. So the show good and the modified date is the alternate key for the show description. The ID never leaves the uh, the database. And uh, so that alternate key is how you identify objects to other systems as you're um, sending these messages around. Store enough meta information at the destination so that you can do that uh, that uh, commutivity check and uh, and make sure that things will result in the same um, effect if the message arrives out of order. So, and now once you've got that, search against uh, Elasticsearch really fast, and uh, returns your alternate key, which then you can go back to your your source system and you can actually bring up that event and say, okay, well, here's the current information from the source system because I've got the alternate key. And so that kind of summarizes. Uh, one more question here. Oh, somebody's trolling you on the date times. <laughs> um, Okay. Yeah, I so, think the pertinent question is from Scott. With content yeah. as the key, what happens if you need to resize all the images or someone runs spell check on your content, for example? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, actually, uh, read a little farther down. The reason why I asked is because if in that system, you may not have the same control of the content that you have in the data store uh, of the uh, database. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the way that I solved that problem is the, um, the, the identity of the, of the content of the image itself, um, is, uh, is different from the identity of the idea that it represents. Um, what I can, you know, like, uh, we are resizing the image. So, um, you know, my, uh, yeah, my mom takes a, a, a picture of Kayla at, uh, uh, at the, in the pumpkin patch. And then you know she wants to um, you know, send that off to you know, Snapfish to have it printed out. So Snapfish wants a smaller version, so she's going to uh, um, to uh, resize it. So the um, the original image is a different piece of content than the one that was resized. But you know, to her and to to every you know, thinking human being, it's uh, it's the same the same object. It's it's the same. Um, uh, Concept, the same idea that you're that you're trying to express. So, um, so I would say in your model, you want to have two separate uh, things for that. So, um, so the image at uh, at each different size is is a different content object, and then the um, you know the the photo uh, is is a, a higher level, higher level concept, and so that photo can get a different alternate key. Um, you know, the the alternate key of the photo could be a good it could be um, the uh, you know the the timestamp from the camera uh, where you know, when it was taken uh, along with GPS coordinates so you know just enough to uh, to make it unique um, uh, just anything that doesn't change about the photo as a as a concept um, so not a description not a name not uh, not something that you would want to go back and, and edit. So like um, maybe size, like height with DPI, perhaps? If you're um, doing like thumbnailing or things like that, or what would you do there? Yeah, so so yeah, each each individual thumbnail 
would be a different content object. And so it would all, they would each have a different hash. Um, and so you could have um, the, the DPI or the resolution be um, extra uh, attributes of the contents because they're all dependent upon the content, just like content type in the example that I showed here. You know, resolution so, could be there as well. I, actually, I, so I appreciate the answer. Thank you. I, what I was thinking of was more to point out that there's a risk you could actually lose the connection between your hashes and the data. Like, for example, if someone ran spell check on your content and then updated the files out of band, you would essentially lose the connection. And I don't know that there would be a way to recreate it. That, mm. that, I was just kind of, I, I was thinking that through and just kind of pointing that out because that can sometimes happen in a cache. And mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. Um, yeah. In general, the the uh, the problem of losing connection, um, uh, the, uh, the the really the the only way to reliably solve that is that you store the information on the client side, on the on the sender side, and then have that device continue to retry until it knows that um, it's been heard, um, and so that turns the data loss problem into a an item potency problem. So you're going to retry. You're going to have duplicates uh, arrive at the uh, uh, at the other end. You just want to make sure that those duplicates don't cause a duplicate effect. So, um, so yeah, using um, content addressable storage uh, in that way, now you can at least ensure that uh, if I send you this document uh, and you know somebody else is is uh, spell checked and so they've got a different hash, so it shows up as a different document. Um, you're going to um, you know, retry enough to know that your version of the document made it. And so now this hash means something to the other side. Uh, it means this version before it's been uh, spell checked. So now what you do with that and that that hash um, to, to say this is the correct version of the document versus that one, that kind of now becomes um, the, uh, the the snapshot or, um, or um, you know, the, in the book, I call it the mutable property pattern, a, a better uh, solution for that problem. Um, so if you think about uh, a different system where that exact kind of, that exact thing happens and we deal with it, um, this uh, this might answer the the ultimate question. If you are editing source code and somebody else edits source code and you both push your source code into some shared repository, um, then that repository, uh, I don't know, maybe it's using a, a, a file system to store those things in Linux and uh, the same person who created Linux also created this, uh, this file system. Um, so in Git, uh, the, um, the commits are identified by the hash of, you know, what goes into the commit, you know, the, the contents. Um, and so, um, when you get that commit up there uh, to the uh, to the other server, um, you're you're saying here's the contents, identify it by this hash, and now this hash um, becomes the the thing that I can talk about with other people about that commit. Hey, do you have this commit? Do you have this commit? You know, no. Okay, I want to push this one to you. Um, and now there's a higher level concept, the branch that points to the commit, and the branch really just points to a hash. It points to a SHA. Um, so, um, so yeah, and Git, uh, if you are like, for example, you're, you're, you're pushing to the, uh, the main branch, um, and somebody else is trying to push as well, you might get your commit up there, but then when you say, okay, update main to now point to this commit and it says, oh, wait, main now is pointing to a different commit. So there's been a, uh, um, a conflict I can't, uh, or a concurrent change. I can't have main point to yours it will reject, but it still might have accepted the commit. The commit might still be on the server. It's just main isn't pointing to it. It's just kind of an orphan commit. And so now it's up to you. You've stored that and you are the retry mechanism. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to rebase, create a new commit and now push that one. And that one gets, uh, gets stored up there. So the same set of solutions are available to you when you're using immutable architectures. A bit of a long-ish answer, but hopefully that uh, that helps there. So, 
in addition to these concepts, um, like I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff is is right about this. The uh, the the book and it goes into so much more. Um, this is this is basically the starting point, the uh, the default when I'm creating a uh, a brand new application and just using the tools that I'm comfortable with. Yeah, you know, this is all, you know, REST APIs. This is all, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, SQL databases. But if you want to get into uh, you know, some uh, some some really deep stuff, um, yeah, you know, this this uh, this book goes uh, goes well beyond. Um, so uh, absolutely, I would encourage you to reach out to me with uh, with any uh, any other questions, concerns. Uh, you can reach me on uh, on Twitter. Um, you can also, uh, if you go up to immutablearchitecture.com, you can join in on our uh, book discussions on uh, Discord, and there the uh, the floor is open, and uh, I'm I'm. You know, more than happy to to kind of noodle around with, uh, different ideas with uh, with folks. Really love it. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for for all the kind words in the in the chat, and uh, thank you for you know for all of your your time and uh, and the questions on the video. Hey, I wanted to tell you thank you. I thought that Git example was really quick thinking on your feet. That's a ah, yes. pretty good example. <laughs> and and then I just wanted to mention the irony of trying to be immutable creates so much more replication of the data. That's kind of a funny concept to think mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah. And back in the day when, um, when storage was expensive, uh, this, this would have been a really hard mm -hmm. uh, decision to defend, but uh, storage is a lot cheaper now. And the value of having that, uh, that historical data um, is it's, it's easy to, uh, um, to, to show that that value outweighs the cost. Yeah, it remind, I mean, it's totally orthogonal to this, but it reminds me of, you know, Alan Kay's concept of factors, which was totally ridiculous back in the day of, you know, <laughs> limited resources. And now it's like, why wouldn't you? Yeah. And I think in a similar way, it's like storage is so cheap now and it, it just, you know, you, you shove all your facts in a Kafka topic and leave them there forever. It's like, geez Louise, you know, why wouldn't you? <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. I, I, I love how you simplified this down and, and even somebody mentioned in the chat, you know, just before, uh, you know, that you kind of have to simplify things and mm -hmm. keep it simple in a presentation like this. But I, I really think that for people who take the time to buy the book and, and process it, there's so much depth in the book that goes, you know, far. Be th this was really just like dipping your toes in the in the edge of the, you know, of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, the deeper you dig into this, you start to see, I mean, really, I mean, the intro to the book says it, but I, I really, you know, feel like the book stands on the shoulders of Bertrand Meyer, you know, Leslie Lamport and, uh, and Donald Knuth. And, and it, it, there's a mathematical fact-based, uh, you know, approach here that I, I really haven't seen anywhere else. And I, th I think there's a lot of benefit to be gained by people grasping the concept and, and thinking about ways that they can implement it in their systems. Michael, when are you gonna when are you gonna be in Portland? <laughs> as soon as I can, absolutely. I, <laughs> right, man. I want to go to the thirsty line with all No, the no, guys. that'll be never. Yeah. <laughs> Craig says, "Thank you for saying guid rather than guid." <laughs> I think it's. I think the appropriate term is UUID, but I, I, that I don't know. <laughs> that is the appropriate term. But I. I came up the .NET route, so yeah, um, I know. Well, I Microsoft did too, guy, but so. you know, uh, yeah, I know. Hey, I used to work with Jeff, and and he would just read out the goods. <laughs> and I said, Jeff, what's the record? And he'd say it's A three B. <laughs> just kidding. Hey, uh, so uh, um, Jeff mentioned uh, Leslie Lamport, and I chatted in the thing. I'd used uh, TLA plus, and one of the notions I like that. That he uses in TLA pluses, the idea of sort of a mathematical formula where you say the record, and then the record or the object prime is what it's going to be, mm -hmm. and it it seems perfect for immutability, and he describes it that way. Have you have you played with that? Uh, I haven't used uh, TLA plus myself yet, um, but um, but yeah, I have uh, looked into what it's um, yeah, what it does, and of course, you know, Laser Lamport, I'm a big fan of. Uh, 
with, with all of his work. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I would say that uh, TLA plus doesn't make the assumption of immutability. Uh, in fact, it's going to assume, okay, we're, we're going to analyze systems that change state over time. Um, if you uh, if you make the assumption that the system is behaving immutably, then um, the the verification that TLA plus does becomes a lot simpler. And in fact, uh, it can be uh, it can be shown um, just uh, algebraically. You can you can prove uh, that a, a system uh, is um, eventually consistent. You can prove a, a, a property called strong eventual consistency. Which sounds like an oxymoron, but is actually a a really um, you know, it has a really you know, precise mathematical definition, and you can prove that based on just the the algorithm that you're using. That's where CRDTs uh, you know, come from. Um, so so yeah, if you can prove something mathematically, and uh, it, you know, TLA plus you know, does does that uh, by you know, by analyzing the the system. Um, uh, it does. Uh, it does uh, static analysis of the of the system, right? It's, it's not runtime. Yeah, it is static analysis. Yeah. Um, but, uh, no, uh, it, it's it's static. I mean, sorry, it's, it's dynamic for the behaviors. Okay. So so yeah, um, if you can if you can get that proof uh, from the description of the algorithm, then uh, um, then I'm 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 a big fan of uh, being able to do that. But you can't you can't assume that all systems are immutable. It'd be nice one day when you can. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't use, it doesn't, you're right. It doesn't specifically use the uh, notion of immutability, but it uses the notion of uh, of the current state and the next state. And yeah. in, it's funny you say that because in my mind, those were always immutable. It was always like, here's the thing and now I'm making a new copy of it. But yeah, that's an interesting observation. I, I just mm -hmm. always assumed that was Im immutability. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of the same principle in uh, in mathematics. When you think of a variable, all of the mathematical operations that you're now going to perform on that variable, it's no longer changing. So why is it called a variable? Well, it's called a variable because it could ha it could take on different values. Um, so you're basically taking that time dimension and you're just just kind of you know, now now unrolling it. So so now every time you change. The state of a thing, you give it a new variable, and so that's the primes and the, and the double primes. Um, so, so that's a way of of kind of taking uh, a system that is, um, from the perspective of the uh, application developer, based on mutability, you're changing state, and then just saying, well, pretend that we didn't change that variable; we allocated a new one, and that that old one is still around somewhere. It's just nobody cares about it anymore. Yeah, good observation. More questions, folks? No, no chats. Conflict-free replicated data type. Oh so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, sorry, I hate to keep hogging the. No, not not at all. Um, I noticed though that your your focus with your demo app was from the point of view of immutability of really the database records or whatever we want to call them. The, the, uh, um, can you tell us about, I haven't read your book, so can you tell us about like uh, message immutability or, um, mm. yeah. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a great paper by Pat Helland, um, mm -hmm. who I talk about a little bit in the book, but uh, probably don't give uh, near enough space too. Um, he's a big fan of immutability as well. Um, so one paper I do talk about is called Immutability Changes Everything. Um, yeah. And that's, that's basically a, a laundry list of these are all the problems that, uh, that we've faced. And hey, immutability, hey, that solves that problem. Hey, immutability solves that problem too. Um, uh, but there's another paper that it didn't reference in the book um, called um, uh, Data on the Inside versus Data on the Outside. And in that one, Oh, you, you're on mute, Scott. Sorry, the Microsoft paper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so oh, that's going old school. That goes way back. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's from like 2002 oh, yeah. or something. Oh, come on, Scott. Don't pretend you love the old ideas. That's where all the good <laughs> stuff is. Yeah. Yeah. Pat Helland was one of the uh, the, the, the the folks on um, he, who brought us 
um, the distributed transaction coordinator. So yeah. don't don't hate on the guy too much, but yeah. <laughs> it took really smart people to make that thing work as well as it uh, as it did. But um, and and uh, and so yeah, uh, in another one of his papers, not the one that I'm about to talk about, but in another one, he talks he kind of talks about uh, how you know, all the stuff that you had to do in order to make uh, the distributed transaction coordinator work. And then it's like kind of halfway through the paper, he's like, and why would you want to do this? Just instead, you know, make your operations uh, associative, commutative, idempotent, and uh, and distributed. He, he invented the the term ACID 2.0. Just 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 math the whole thing and you're done. Yes. Just math it. Yes. Yeah. So if your application has these properties, then you don't require your database to have the ACID mm. properties in a distributed fashion, which look what we had to do. It's really hard. Just don't. So um, anyway, uh, data on the inside versus data on the outside. <clears throat> there he's talking about the characteristics of, um, of data that's in the database, data on the inside, um, versus uh, you know, data that's in messages that are flowing between systems, data on the outside. <clears throat> and, um, and he basically you know, draws this, um, you know, this, this uh, line where uh, the the inside data tends to be mutable. It tends to to change. Uh, you're changing the uh, the state of your of your database. Um, data on the outside tends to be immutable um, because now you're creating a message. You're sending it to a system. You can't take it back. You can't um, change the message while it's still in flight. Um, you know, if you <clears throat> if you even try, you're going to end up in in weird uh, places. Like, you know, okay, I sent this message. Oh, a new change came in. You know, let me let me try to retract that one. Well, it already it already went out. You know, don't even try to retract. Just you know, figure out how to how to make those messages commute. Um, and and so um, so in this paper, he's not saying immutability good, mutability bad. He's saying that the um, the properties of mutability are important for a, a certain um, you know, set of reasons and. Having those um, inside your system um, is is a good thing, and it solves you know these problems. Uh, immutable data is solving a different set of problems, and having that flow between your systems is a good thing, and so that's uh, solving those sets of problems. And so, um, so basically, the conclusion of, of of that paper is choose the right thing for data on the inside versus data on the outside. Um, so. Yeah, I actually kind of contradicted his conclusion by saying everything should be immutable, but um, uh, but there, yeah, he's really calling out that the messages are immutable and they have to be for really good reasons. So I think where I butt heads a lot with my own teams is when I have the notion that the JavaScript client is outside and my backend services are the inside. Mm. The, can you talk about that at all? Yeah. Um, so I. Uh, so. It, yeah. So um, when I, when I talk about a a node in general, um, a uh, a unit um, a, a machine that uh, that can perform uh, operations, um, I tend to <clears throat> to talk about a node that has behavior and state, and it's all it's all. Um, you know, combined in there, um, <clears throat> and when you when you read the papers about uh, conflict-free replicated data types, um, that's the idea of the node that they are um, that they're really talking about. Um, so the you know, really the idea of the stateless node that now talks to a database in order to um, to get its its state and to you know make its operations, it really does just kind of disappear uh, when you're when you're doing that math. Um, it's just a proxy for the database, which is the real node in the system. So, um, so yeah, if you've got uh, your your Java application and it's talking to a, a, a SQL database, you are you know, yeah, you're you know, creating certain different different replicas of that uh, Java application and you know, putting them behind a load balancer and then all talking to the same database. So, uh, in effect, because they are stateless, you're just talking to one node, just one database. Um, so, so yeah, that uh, uh, the the now the distinction between what's on the inside and what's on the outside is really just 
you know, what's the abstraction that you're putting on top of that node and what you're, what you're the abstraction um, <clears throat> insofar as the outside world is concerned is the API. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, if the only way to get to your database was through that API, then I would say that the, the Java application is part of the inside data because it's stateless and it just kind of disappears. But um, I think where, um, where you're coming from is that it's not the only way to get to your database. Um, there are other systems that are running reports that are doing ETL, that are um, <clears throat> performing other operations. Um, and so now your, or your other surface area. Types. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so your surface area um, is now not just the, the, Externally facing API, it's uh, it's all of those, um, yeah, all of those ways into the uh, into the database. <clears throat> so, so yeah, that's probably the distinction I would draw. Thank you. Cool. Eldred would like to address the uh, doctor in the background. Yes, yes, that. Uh, uh, yeah, honestly, my doctor is the uh, is the fourth doctor. Um, but uh, my daughter uh, grew up uh, with uh, with David Tennant, but there, that's uh, Matt Smith. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hers is David Tennant. Um, we're, we're, Matt Smith was a was a, a really good doctor. So um, I was quite pleased when my uh, when my wife got me the cut out uh, sorry, for my birthday. Doctor, doctor who? <laughs> no, Doctor <laughs> Where? <laughs> exactly. S second base. Second base. Doctor Win. <laughs> Scott, I think part of the, the intrigue for me is connecting this with some of the concepts from another book I mentioned earlier, um, you know, Writing Software by Yuval Lowy. And, and uh, you know, one of the core concepts in that book is encapsulating volatility and encapsulating it within your system. And, and typically in, in, that, uh, in that realm, you know, system is defined as kind of a, a standard SOA architecture, right? Where you you have a backend system, and maybe you've got a messaging bus and and things of that nature, and you have you know orchestrators that are sequencing uh, steps in a use case, and you have engines that are maybe uh, you know performing different steps at different uh, you know based on context of a particular step, and then you have resource access that's kind of abstracting away your access to resources or subsystems. And and so one of the things that I've been, um, you know, kind of playing around with um, in my mind is, how, you know, kind of reconciling those concepts, because one of the core tenets of that is you, you really do want to prevent your client applications from, well, let me step back for a minute. The irony is we've worked so hard to try to keep business logic out of the client applications. And, and so mm -hmm. what ends up happening is, you know, validation logic and some basic business validation ends up being encapsulated in the, in the system. And yet the irony is the most important business logic leaks into the client and that's the orchestration of use cases. So you have these clients that are talking to eight different microservices and trying to orchestrate these processes. And that's like the most important, like that's the fundamental stuff. And yet that's what leaks into the clients because microservices suck because nobody knows how to do them properly because they don't have orchestration. If you don't have orchestration, you don't, it's just, yeah, it's a disaster. So I've been trying to like comprehend, you know, kind of the best way to sort of marry these two concepts and, and even, you know, thinking of ways to kind of even distribute those rules of how you define a flow, like a business flow, because I, I do value very deeply the, the concepts that Michael has, you know, delineated in the book of location uh, independence and autonomy. And so it, it's almost like flipping things around a little bit and saying, the rules still matter, but how do we distribute those rules out to empower the nodes to be able to follow the rules rather than having to have a centralized place where all the rules are applied and then the client applications simply have to defer to the you know core system to apply those rules. So that's 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 kind of where I think my next like exploration leads. And I well, think it's okay, go ahead, Scott. Oh, sorry, you're, it's your talk. Uh, <laughs> hey, wait, technically uh, it's I'm my for you. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, Rich, go ahead. Uh, no, no, uh, no. so it, 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 at a micro scale, that's what you're doing with new good, right? You're saying good, new good. And it used to be that, you know, only SQL knew how to do that and .NET figured out how to do it. And mm -hmm. Before that, and I'm now sure the Linux can do it. Yeah, uh, the first, first Bill Gates came up with the idea and then, uh, Yes, that's right. It came from Microsoft. Yes. <laughs> but um, 
but to Jeff's point, that is the problem, right? Because as the logic, uh, just even new goods, a good example, I've written new good. And if you look around for say JavaScript versions of it, there's some based on the date time clock and, mm -hmm. you know, and then your, your, your hope of a non collision is simply based again on time and ticks. And it's like, Oh no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so even at the micro level, you have these business logic dispersions that are a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I, I, th I think it's so. Yeah, with the with the goods, I I do tend to use goods really high up in the model, um, and then for the rest of the things, I'll combine the uh, identities in order to get things that are unique. Um, so so by the time you get down below the level of what one uh, human being is going to be doing, timestamps great. So this particular human being is only going to be doing, you know. One thing at a, at a particular clock tick. Well, actually, um, when you were you were uh, drawing the drawing and you said something about the arrows going up or something, it yeah. occurred to me that then you have to update the tables in the order of the arrows. Yes. Ah, but you, you do and you don't. Not a bug. Yeah, well, they, yeah. But okay. You can receive the facts. Then mm -hmm. that's a whole. Read the book, Scott. Get the book. <laughs> <laughs> what the, is this? The, what does this thing read you speak of, Jeff? Oh, <laughs> uh, if you're not reading, then you do you need to find a new, new yeah, but uh, never mind. I'm not going to be so rude. And, and, and kind of riffing on the idea of the business logic leaking out to the client. Um, if you, if you, if you, you follow all the way through chapter 12, you, you take the, the idea to its conclusion, where we end up is immutable run times. Um, and, uh, yeah, something I call it the decision substrate. Um, so, an immutable runtime is application agnostic. Your application is not actually running in it. It's just it's just a runtime that knows how to uh, to you know, persist data, how to distribute it, how to enforce the distribution and the uh, and the authorization rules, uh, how to run queries, how to update uh, you know, others when when new information comes in that they're interested in. Um, so it can glean all of this information from just simply a description of the model. Um, and, and I, I show you how to describe the model in a, a language I call factual. Um, and so you just give a factual model to an immutable runtime, and now you can point your application at it, and all of the business logic is in the client. Oh, I never dug into this, but there was this crazy version of that using uh, JavaScript, uh, uh, JSON, uh, description language that Microsoft was showing at build. Huh. Did, did you see that? Um, God, it was, what was that relating to Jeff? Did you see that? I don't, but that sounds, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. They had a model in Jason. I forget what it's called. Like Jason table description language, some Microsoft acronym. Huh. And, and then it would go with the, it would go with the send. And then on the other end, all the actions were in response to maybe it was like updating cards or something UI related, yeah. but mm -hmm. the, the idea could obviously extend like you're saying, Michael, to uh, mm -hmm. an intelligence system that also just did updates or whatever the credit operation or business logic. Anyway, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the irony, that's Scott, you know, we, we've worked so hard to keep the, the orchestration logic out of the client. And, and I think that's the right approach The the client shouldn't, define or declare the orchestration logic. But what if you could define and declare the orchestration logic and then hand it over to the client and, and as long as it followed the rules. Why don't you make my delegates come slap you? I, I'm just saying, I, I think there's something to, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a marriage here that, that I, I see happening. Man, and, if uh, you can build and give me a cross the wire funk I'll kiss you on the lips. Well, that's, that's, that, I, you know, a crosswire funk, it's really going to come down to messaging ultimately. I mean, right. And you can't pretend we we've seen the flaws of, of, uh, of web forms, right. Trying to pretend that HTTP isn't a real thing. Let's just pretend it's wind forms. And that's, that's bogus. That doesn't work. Um, but I, I think there's something here. I really, I really think there's something here about putting autonomy out at the margins, but that autonomy mm -hmm. needs a context. It needs constraints and it needs consistency. And I, I think this idea that Michael is talking about with immutable runtimes, and you know, if you have a TypeScript immutable runtime that can run with, you know, you're using um, using web workers and you're using um, 
index DB and things like that to you know accumulate queues of things on the client, and then you're distributing those and shipping those back to a, you know different nodes. Seriously, you got to get the book. Like I, 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 I don't make any money from. I'm not shilling for the book. Okay, I'm just saying like to even have the the rest of the conversation. It's like getting the context of what you'll get from the book is is so so helpful. And given what you already know about you know Yuval's book and things like that, Scott, I think it'd be really fun to sort of like take that to the next level and see where it goes. Yeah, it'll be, uh, you know, Thursday by nine or Friday by 12. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the reasons that I don't actually even get to decision substrate until chapter 12. It's like you have to have all of this in order to see, and this is how you can run your business. This is how you can uh, now integrate with your partners. It, it, forget blockchains. Everybody should be running a decision substrate. Yeah. And you even talk in the book about how you can take existing static systems mm -hmm. and basically lay a substrate on top of them so that other systems can interact with them as if they were an immutable, yeah. you know, immutable system. And then you can also write out to a you know, system, a standard system from your immutable architecture. So it's, it really is laid out there. You know, uh, unfortunately, you know, Michael talks about immutable runtimes, but we don't have it yet. So it's yeah. like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like colonies on Mars. Yes, let's go Elon Musk. And it's like, damn it, we don't have it yet. Well, it'll be cool when we do, but we don't. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. So there's some of that. <laughs> so yeah. we got to build it. We got to build the spaceship to colonize Mars. Yeah. And the closest thing I got is a, an open source project called Janaga. So yeah. that's, that's where I'm trying to build that up and make that into the, uh, the dream of the decision substrate. Do, do you want to tell us about it? Uh, well, this is, this is a, uh, a TypeScript um, uh, immutable runtime. So uh, the elevator pitch is that when you're building a progressive web app, um, so the application works offline, right? Because uh, PWAs are able to cache your JavaScript and your HTML and your CSS. Um, what PWAs don't give you out of the box is how to cache your data. So that's what Janaga uh, adds to it, is that now you've got an immutable um, uh, graph of, of your data stored in IndexedDB that uh, you, what you do is you add to that by just saying, I'm adding this JSON object to the graph. And that JSON object can refer to predecessors. They're just embedded objects within that JSON. Um, and then you can um, express a query in terms of a function. So you know, I'm going to write a function. Anything that would satisfy this function is, um, is something that I'm interested in. So you, you write that function. You say, anytime something matches this, call me back. I will update uh, my React uh, user interface. I'll update my Angular user interface, whatever. Um, and, uh, and so you write that. It's going to read from your index DB update to user interface. Somebody's going to make a change, um, then uh, WebSockets can push it at you. It'll update your user interface. You, the user makes the decision, creates a new JSON object, stores it in IndexedDB, sends it back to the server, and then bounces it out to other people who are interested in it. So you get that collaboration all through JSON objects that are stored locally and shared with the others based on their interest. It's like one great big Behavior monad. <laughs> I'm going to have to dissect that. Hmm. Big fan Je of monads. Yeah. Je Je Jeff knows that's what I've been working on. Is like, yeah. So is that the funk over the wire? Like the it would be. It would be if I could do it. But uh, well, it's, seriously. Yeah. But Scott, like, it's it. <laughs> funk over the wire. I, I don't make any money from promoting Michael's book. Okay, I swear to God, when you when you when you read and and you you see his description. It's of, it's hang more. on, hang on. Uh, when, okay, when, when you see his description of pipelines, it it's it's a lot of what you're looking for. It's not everything, but like it's so much of what you're looking for is this ability to describe a pipeline that satisfies a set of conditions of where exists and where not exists, and 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 you're not querying your fact model based on individual properties you're basing it on mathematical properties of existence or non-existence and then you can build up these pipelines for satisfying those queries and it's giving you a lot of what you're looking for there in in that regard 
Well, to answer what Michael asked, it's more like funk on the wire. It, it's like right now we send the data, but it's mm -hmm. really hard to send the funk along with it, which is, I imagine, why you're thinking TypeScript, right? Because you can send that as data. No. Um, yeah. yeah pipelines I, I, don't require TypeScript. It, it's a. It's more declarative than that. Right, but yeah. that's the idea that I'm, I'm getting to is the mm -hmm. notion that um, uh, let, let, did you use mm -hmm. your example earlier, Jeff, of, of validation. Uh, if, if that could then just be a packet that went, it wouldn't matter where it was executed because it would still be a logical part of your system. Right. And that's what I'm getting at. And then your system would still maintain control of it because it could send it along with the data and you could say, here's the data and here's how you validate it. Yeah, this is what REST was supposed to be. Nobody reads Roy Fielding's thesis because nobody wants <laughs> to take the time to bother. But you know, one of the fundamental facets of, of REST, which was really a description of how the web works, not a prescription for how it should work, was the ability to distribute code and expect it to be executed by the, the nodes in the system. Uh, this is a similar concept, right? How do you distribute these pipelines out to different parts of the system and allow them to execute those pipelines in their own context? And yeah, it's just... Mm. Distribute code to nodes in a system? What, that sounds like <laughs> JavaScript. Yeah, well, no, right. they, that, it, that's what Roy was talking about. Yeah. But you know, now mm -hmm. you're talking about something even more declarative, right? Your mm -hmm. pipelines, if they're declarative, who cares what language is it? Is it Rust? Is it JavaScript? Is it, I don't care. It's just mm -hmm. as long as you, as long as everybody executes the pipelines in the same way, we can mm. play together, right? Yeah. Uh, important thing, pipelines are not Turing complete. Right. So it's not just, hey, I'm going to wrap up some JavaScript code and, and send it in. Um, well, that in, means you got to write your next book and make them Turing complete. Come well, on, that, right? that, 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 would be, <laughs> that would be the monadic part. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but if, if they were Turing complete, now the, um, you know, all of the cost of that comes into play. The, uh, um, you know, the uh, Unchindings problem comes into play. And um, and so you can't. There 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 would be now certain things you couldn't prove about the uh, the funk that's on the wire. Um, so so I chose something that's that's incredibly constrained, so that you can now prove the things that you need to prove, uh, and you're only allowed to use these uh, particular operations. Yeah. One of the important things that uh, that you can prove is that uh, this other pipeline, this inverse of the first one will yield all of the um, you know all of the inputs that would have changed the output. Have you seen code? Dude, everyone's code is so up that, that the idea that I'm gonna get something that I sent myself and then execute it is such a dream compared to like the crap that's out there on the wire mm. in, 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 in the stuff that Jeff wrote or this that's what he says about the stuff that I wrote. It's like Come on, man. That's so. I get what you're saying, but the the idea that your system would execute the remnants of stuff it sent itself solves the Turing problem, as far as I'm concerned. It's the it's the notion that I got to deal with what the third party uh, 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 contractors in India wrote, or the guys in Indiana when I'm here in California, and and they didn't fully understand the business rules versus say, you can send them a packet that is both the data and the code. You see what I'm saying? It's, hmm. it, it, Sounds it, like we're, maybe... we're not that far off. It's, but, but if you get that off, it, it's the, mm -hmm. the whole system becomes garbage. And so you're just trying to narrow down where that business logic is to a controllable sphere. Mm -hmm. But you're not um, trying to solve the whole world. You're not trying to make all the code perfect. You're yeah. just trying to make it not screwed up. It's, it's the opposite problem. It's not that you have to make it Turing good. You just have to make it valid. Make it not suck. Make it not <laughs> suck. Make it, make it so that some dude five states away who I only talked to on email understood it. Because he, no, I don't even want him to understand it. I want him to execute the validation methods I sent with the, mm -hmm. you know, or my API or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this is actually reminding me a little bit of smart contracts because um, those go on the blockchain along with all the, uh, the data. 
and Very everybody well executes them. Everyone executes them in the same way. Um, so smart contracts, um, they they solve the problem of everyone gets the the same answer because everyone's got the same data and they've got the same the, the same smart contract, and so they run it and so everyone agrees, and everyone can agree that you just lost all your money. <laughs> Has happened, um, and it's it's because. Uh, they don't solve the understanding the code problem. Um, right. They, uh, even even a simple smart contract can hide complexity uh, enough for you to ship a bug. But now you shipped a bug on an immutable uh, uh, record that is also the um, you know, the the place where you're storing your money. So mm. you shipped a very costly bug. Um, so. So yeah, I, I, I can see solving the problem of everybody running the same code and getting the same result. I can't see the problem of everybody understanding what they what they wrote or verifying that it was what you intended it to be, especially if it's something that allows all that complexity. Well, but look, you have the same problem just with another set of clothes on with versions of the data and the format, even with the code you displayed today. If it's not description, but it's a major description, minor description, long description, short description, you have that same problem because your message is going to go out there. Then when it comes mm -hmm. back, the database uh, schema's changed. What do you do mm -hmm. then? And, right? It's just, and this is this is why it's about control. And if I could send the validation that went with description, mm -hmm. and then later send the validation that goes with long description, short description. Like you know, episode and title, or episode and description. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, what you're kind of hinting at is, um, so, so yeah, this was this example was all built on a relational database, and that was so that it's it's you know easily accessible is the is the very first step, but the uh, the immutable runtime is not based on a relational database. It doesn't even know what your application is. So how could it know your application, your database schema? Um, so it's completely schemaless. And the way that it solves that problem is structural versioning. That when I when I give you an immutable fact, its very structure um, tells you what version of the uh, of the you know the you know, the schema was used to create it. Um, so I don't call it version one, version two, version three because that puts them in in order. It's just this is a hash of the structure of of the fact, and that is the version. And so now, if you can understand that version. You know it because you can compile your code. You can compute the hash, and you can say, "Yep, I, that's that's the one I'm expecting." And so now you can participate in that conversation. But if you see one that's a different structural version than you understand, you just simply ignore it and all of its successors. And now you've got the subset of the tree that you can understand and the part of the conversation you can participate in. So, um, so yeah, you have to go uh, beyond the relational database in order to uh, start to address some of the problems that you're talking about. But I don't think that uh, um, that you know, I'm offering any solution as to uh, yeah, uh, humans being able to um, to express their intent in a way that can always be understood and will be free of, of defects. Um, yeah. Come There's on, you're not promising humans. to solve <laughs> yeah. all of our problems. <laughs> I'm not buying that book unless it solves all my problems. No, but you know, it's interesting <laughs> if you took that example. And then combined it with your answer to my question earlier, mm. and the node that you were, that instead of was the code, was mm -hmm. a was a get commit ID, mm. and where it went to look up the code was the get repo. Then you could mm -hmm. see, oh, that code's been modified, and the bug is fixed, and you could follow the the commit chain on get, that branch Scott, get the book scott get the book scott <laughs> no, get the that, book. Hey, you're right back to the same concept but yeah. you can now fix the code it's awesome I no it. no that one of the earliest examples in the book is two people updated i mean michael even showed the example today you know today but he solved it a different way because he was trying to simplify the example but you know you basically you have one person updated the the contact phone number and another person updated the contact name. So what do you do in, in git if that happens well you either create a merge commit or you rebase and then you you make a new commit like whatever but that that's that's basically the concept here as well it's like the the only thing that you need to make sure that you do and this is this is the, the fundamental difference is every node needs to be able to resolve that conflict without making a new commit 
until a new commit is, is created, mm. right? They need, and they need to resolve it in the same way, however you decide you're going to do that. So in other words, you know, however you decide to reconcile that conflict, um, each node needs to be able to come up with a, you know, basically a mathematical formula that results in the same state as a result of, of playback, if you will, of those, you know, those different, um, those different facts. But, you know, beyond that, it's, it's pretty similar to the problems we have with Git. And then of course, somebody can come along and say, oh yeah, I'm going to reconcile that. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to say, yep, merge those two. It's good. Make a new commit. And, and that's why when you look at, um, you know, factual modeling, you'll see that anything that is a, um, anything, any, 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 uh, mutable, it's not really mutable. Okay. But it's, it's a quote unquote faux mutable, if you will, uh, basically can reference its, its predecessors, uh, its priors is, is uh, probably the best way of saying it and merge multiple of them together in order to create a new state of, of those, uh, you know, those quote unquote faux mutables. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense, Scott, but that's yeah. kind of the idea. And that, that thing that, uh, that Jeff was just talking about of everybody doing the calculation and coming up with the same answer without um, resolving the conflict, without writing anything back to the, yeah. uh, to the system, that actually is a, a very good definition of strong eventual consistency. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what that, uh, that promise means. So, so yeah, if you can prove that an algorithm can satisfy that promise, now you um, you can have confidence that uh, that you know, as as the system quiesces, that uh, that you know, everybody understands what happened, um, and it's that's usually precisely the promise that you want. Uh, it's just really hard for people to uh, to express that. Yeah, and we try to solve it with the optimistic consistency, which you know again that was even an example you showed in the demo just mm -hmm. now. But the the power I think really comes. You think about how businesses usually solve problems is they discovered downstream that there's some kind of conflict. And so what do they do? Well, they intervene and they do something to resolve it. You know, let's say I mm -hmm. got two submissions of the same invoice for some crazy reason. What's going to happen? And it well, in, 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 in standard, you know, RDBMS world, you know, oh, Optimus can turn, it's either last, last in wins or some person just like gets a message and they just, you know, slam over mm -hmm. whatever's there with whatever they think it should be. Whereas in a real business process, you'd look at the two, invoices and you'd say, I need to reconcile these things. Maybe I need to call the customer. Maybe I need to do this. Maybe. What, whatever it might be is a business decision. But in the end, what are you going to do? You're going to reconcile those two invoices together into the actual, this is what's going to move forward. And, and I feel like factual model, I don't feel like it's, it's mathematically demonstrable. Mm -hmm. the, the, the factual modeling approach actually solves that problem in a way that aligns with the business really does. And I think that's one of the big powerful parts of it mm -hmm. too. You're not trying to pretend that we can just use, you know, some technology or, or some pattern like optimistic concurrency to solve a business problem. You're actually solving it the way the business would really solve it in the real world, which is very powerful. Well, and I would, uh, I, I, I got to think about what you just said, Jeff, because I, I got to see what, I don't know enough about factual modeling to hold the model mm -hmm. in my head. Yeah. But the example we were talking about just a second ago where you went sent the code with the uh, data hmm. and there was a bug in the code is no different than the client having a bug oh yeah totally. it came from the, the server problem. and that's right and and think about this we even have this problem now let's say you're using azure and you've got 10 20 servers out there running in your web farm or even three or four you update the code and what microsoft will do behind the scenes is like you know, uh, uh, cycle in the update on the various servers. Mm. And so mm -hmm. for the, this little period of time, you have one server running with the bugs and the other two running fixed. And that's why in practice, a lot of times you go, okay, shut it all down. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you, you say this, we've got to fix the bug. There we goes our five nines, but at least yeah. we'll be consistent. Yeah, exactly. So, so my point was simply, that this problem actually exists today anyway. We still yeah. have that. It doesn't it's just like we think of it as different just because you're pulling the code off the server. Come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rather than sending it with the message, hey, you still have that problem. So maybe to Michael's point, you have a broadcast that invalidates those messages, or there's some sort of a thing that you can check with, like, am I still valid? Yeah. 
But nice. I'll caution you, it sounds like you're trying to solve the problem topologically. So you're relying upon infrastructure, broadcast infrastructure, one place I can check. No, that was me speaking topologically. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and even there, you know, I mean, if once you get the book and you look at it, you'll even see that there's this notion of more, and I'll say more centralized nodes, and then maybe intermediate nodes, and then you know edge nodes. So like at the very furthest edge, you might have a device, and maybe that device, because it's for a certain tenant or a certain location geographically or whatever it might be, it's going to tend, it's going, it's going to talk to certain intermediary nodes. And then those intermediary nodes are going to tend to talk to more centralized nodes over time. And, and but the point is, it's possible that those intermediate nodes can also enforce these, you know, these rules, like you're saying, Scott. So you could still distribute that logic so that you're not location dependent and how you're, you know, sort of relying on a third party to, re, to uh, evaluate that for you. You just don't want to be dependent on a particular this location for doing that kind of a thing, but that, right? That is, that is the conversation that's going on in my head. Uh, yeah. You're talking about runtimes and I'm thinking about things like Dapper and uh, yeah. being able to control where things get routed to, to various services, which might be various versions of the same thing. The messages are going out and I want a better way to solve those problems. And I want, what I really want is something much more like a factory where I can speak much more fluently and it doesn't take six weeks to set up a server and get logic running. I can spin mm -hmm. things up like a This factor. is why you want an immutable runtime. It precisely. is. It, it is, exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it, yes. it, it's, you know, event sourcing is great. And it yes. was a great step in the right mm -hmm. direction. It's too much work. But when you marry, yeah, it is. And the problem with the event sourcing too is it doesn't handle causal, uh, mm -hmm. what am I looking for, Michael? Causal. Relationships. Uh, yeah, it doesn't handle causal relationships. It. It, it, it doesn't model those. And when you, when you start doing historical modeling with facts, you actually see the causal relationship. So it has some similarities to event sourcing, but it's, it's an improvement upon it because you're actually seeing the relationships between these facts as they kind of uh, you know, come into existence and, and get, get shared across the nodes. So it, it really, and, and we should probably wrap it up too because we're getting late on time. And I know Michael, you're 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 getting close to midnight over there in your neck of the woods. So um, well, I'm sure Jan's uh, yeah. already asleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jan just fell asleep and he's still <laughs> online, but he's not really watching anymore. <laughs> oh, there oh, he, he flickered. Oh, oh there, there he is, is. Hey, Jan, you're st <laughs> Man, you're gonna have a long day tomorrow. So what's Friday like? <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be a long day, hey Jan, can you tell us who won the United States presidential election, please? Because yeah. you're in the future. Yeah, please tell us. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> no, I don't. Either way, I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, I, I see. I see the same results as you see. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, hey, Michael, I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Who, really fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for those yeah, who hung you. around this long. Ho hopefully you, you benefited from the the ongoing uh, you know chat that was going on. But um, yeah, check out uh, immutablearchitecture.com. Find Michael's book on amazon.com. And also, uh, you if you go to immutablearchitecture.com, you can join the Discord chat. And uh, there are now weekly standups going that uh, Michael has started on uh, a team that's going to be working on Janaga and the immutable runtime. So lots of opportunities to get involved, lots of opportunities to learn. And yeah, thanks again, Michael, for being here. It was awesome. Thank you. Right on. <laughs> we'll be posting it up and I'll send messages out to everybody. Thank you. Take thanks, care. everybody. Thanks, Rich. Right, See thanks. you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.